whenever they tell me something, I'm like, I don't want your opinion. Like, just, just focus on killing. <laughs> Do like, what I, f <laughs> I, 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 actually, I actually hate when people give me their opinion in this team. And I'm just like, just trust me. I'm like, just trust me. Like, just trust? I love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. that every, so much. And everyone, everyone always trusts me too, so. Oh my lord. I hope everybody has had sufficient time to decompress, to calm down. And in Vance's case, take a gigantic dump. That's right. Welcome back to Valorant, everybody. Uh, Vance, uh, good to have you here, man. You're under the weather. Uh, some, uh, some food-related issues here. Yeah, man. I don't think I don't think Vietnam is made to have like Korean barbecue grills outside when it's like just a little pot with like charcoal and you're like trying to cook your food. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that, chat. You you guys just want to eat at a regular restaurant with a regular grill if you want to have regular Korean barbecue. Just don't do it in the streets. I don't get it really. Our ancestors used to eat motherfucking brontosaurus burger over a fucking, you know, a, a wooden spit roast. I don't really know what the problem is. I think we've gotten fucking weak. Yeah. We weak. Socialize. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Anders, what's up, man? Good to have you back on the show, dude. Uh, Happy to be huge back. Huge week last week. And I think a lot of our expectations were subverted. Uh, but I'm sure you're feeling pretty good that uh, North America is back on top. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's good to see, like, uh, all the asterisks of the event aside, like, it's nice to have some ebb and flow to who are winning these major events. If it was just like, oh, EU's won its third event in a row, like that shit gets boring fast, faster mm. than anything. Like whether or not I have an affinity for one region or another aside, like it's glad to see regions fighting back regardless of who they are. Yeah, obviously uh, for North America as well, not an easy run. Uh, Optic definitely did it the hard way. Let's talk about what we've got on deck for today's show. Obviously, there's a lot of the last week to talk about. I'm sure many of you have probably know the high-level uh, outline of what this show is going to be before seeing it. But we will talk about uh, Zeta Division because I think it's one of the, the most compelling narratives of Iceland. A lot of people really getting excited about this team. The individual performance uh, from some of their players was insane. And the improvement from this roster just wholesale throughout the tournament was really impressive. They unfortunately fall allowed, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And then uh, we're going to get Chet on the show. So we're really lucky Woo! to have, of course, a, a, a sort of Masters winning coach coming back on the show to discuss just sort of what this kind of win was made of. Quite a historic moment for, for this team who's, you know, often been the bridesmaid and never the bride. So uh, great to uh, have the chance to pick his brain. And then we'll talk, of course, about the newest agent tease for Valorant Fade. Looking like some pretty solid mum energy there. I know a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people have shared their thoughts on the aesthetic, but we're going to talk about the kit as well. So stay tuned for that towards the end of the show. If we have time, we'll maybe stick in some roster news as well. All right, let's go back to Masters. I know it's many people, but there's some really incredible moments that I want to recap. And in order to do so, we're going to bring uh, a special guest back onto the show. We loved having her last time. It's great to have her again once more. Dan Dryad, welcome back to Valoranting. Hey, thank you, thank you. It's it's. Honestly, you know, it's been so many days, right? 12 days of Valor Masters and now it's over. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's not crazy, over yet. It's crazy come down. It's just, it was so, it's such a dense schedule. It's, of games, yeah. And now there's fucking nothing. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm still right? in a high. I'm still in a high, man. Optic one, you know, next week's already the qualifiers <laughs> for Masters two. I mean, we don't have too much of a break. I was going to say, there's like no rest for the wicked here. That's the thing that honestly struck me the most is I was like, oh, there's no Valor to watch. And then I look at the schedule and I'm like, holy shit, starts back up again in like a week. They really plan the calendar really well. You have maybe like a couple of days to rest and then it's back again in every region too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's refresh your memories. Uh, uh, and let's have a look at this bracket from Masters because we obviously have tried to cover you know this every week as, as we've gone through it here. What we're interested in is sort of Upper final, lower semi-final, or final grand final. So there's four big matches that we really want to dig into uh, if we possibly can. The story up until this point, right, was Optic Gaming looked pretty good through the upper bracket, right? Getting that win against DRX was uh, a very close last match. That split game was really incredible. DRX very boomed by that result, who fell to the lower bracket and then got knocked out by Zeta Division. Uh, obviously, Paper Rex handily dispatched the Garden G2 after being knocked down uh, there uh, as well by DRX. So we came into these last four matches with a lot of uncertainty. Optic, uh, you know, we, we knew Optic were going up against Loud. And while Loud, look, they played Team Liquid and G2, right? Two teams that, well, I mean, Liquid weren't even supposed to be there. G2 were questionable. Uh, they were a little shaky, honestly, uh, in their way through. Even though they beat Zeta Division, right? But we, we sort of saw Zeta improve a lot. So expectations for, for Optic were not high. Everyone thought Loud would really be the strongest team. And then Paper Rex and Zeta Division was, was such a 
you know, ridiculous matchup. No one really knew what to make of it. And, and until the very end, I think we were held in suspense. But I want to talk about this Optic Loud matchup, right? Because going in, uh, Loud feels like a favorite. It feels like this Brazilian region is looking insane. Uh, Dan, do you, do you sort of feel like they, you know, exceeded your expectations after this first couple of rounds? Like coming to this match, they seemed like the, honestly, I'll, I'll say it, the number one team at this tournament. They seemed like the very best team uh, at this event where I don't think many people had them pegged for that position. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing here is that I had high expectations when, when I made the bracket after we knew the teams that were going to be in the playoffs. I had Loud winning the grand finals and I had them making it all the way up to there. So I, I was expecting a lot from them. I saw them, you know, when they were playing Challengers, had BCT, they were having a pretty good performance and they were bringing a lot of variety that I never saw in Brazil. But when it came to the finals, when it came to Optic, I was concerned because we know how the narrative goes, right? We know, um, we saw Optic Optic uh, with a rematch uh, against Guard, against Xerxia, yeah. and then it was uh, Loud's time. So I just feel like there's a, there's a secret going on for Optic. They always have something hidden. They had a bunch of new strategies that we got to see. And for Loud, we saw a little bit more of everything that we had already seen. There wasn't as much variety. So after I saw the beginning of the, I saw that first match, I knew it was going to be Optic taking it. <laughs> It, it was going to be a tough game uh, for for yeah. loud. I think I think in general a lot of people still. I, I feel like it was split between like optic and loud uh, in terms of like the fan base of who we think are actually going to make it through uh, to the grand finals and win it all. For me, loud finally had their first big test when they actually played against optic uh, in the uh, in the upper finals because I feel like they haven't really gotten tested in their own region because everybody is that much lower in terms of, like the skill gap uh in 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 brazil and, and then once we got into the bracket then you know they they had to play some teams that uh weren't supposed to be there and then they almost had like an easier run now you get this matchup versus optic and after this first map where victor is just like popping off and this is actually my first yeah. I, I think this is actually the first and only over overdrive kill that i've seen from victor in masters with neon uh, uh from like any bcts to this one too which was actually pretty cool finally he's gotten a kill with it the only other person i've seen that got kills with the overdrive was uh was it Solcas pretty much when he was playing yeah. um, neon as well so uh I, I was excited for that but i think optic looked really really good on this map i feel that loud definitely weren't test wasn't tested enough on this map uh especially i think their closest game most recently, it was against like NIP when NIP wasn't even using, uh, I think, like a breach and a raise, uh, which made things a, a little bit more questionable and, and easier also for players like Les to hold uh, sight. So this was this was really fun to watch. Um, it feels like uh, on the attacking side, Loud really, really kind of get shut down. Like they struggle to create a, a lot of action at all here. I think it's safe to say at this point that the Fracture is like solidified as a really good map for optic right one that is going to be a go-to yeah. for them here yeah it looked really good and also every single first half that we saw for loud in the grand finals it was disappointing like it didn't give as much as we were expecting and this attacking side too was the biggest one we saw a little bit of a comeback too but even then doing it three times where you don't start in the best way possible for a grand finals mm -hmm. it just it just seems like loud wasn't as prepared to the grand finals i want to say i mean the variety again the optic had the strategies that they had were things that we never saw before even even on the last map too uh where uh, i'm sure we'll get into breeze it, it, the perma ban for optic and they already i mean they had a pretty good performance and i don't think that was uh, that was a mix of optic knowing that that was going to be a possibility for the grand finals but it also um loud and even Sassy said it, no, they were they were expecting to make it to the top eight. They were expecting to make it as far as possible, but they never ever thought about getting to the grand finals. And I feel like that's also a mental thing that that allowed. I mean, they already proved how far they can get, but now um, for whatever we see from them after is just more preparing for that end, which it seems like Optic was already always waiting for. Yeah, this is the final moments here of this uh, sort of fracture map. I'm probably more interested in talking about the rest of the series here because I think Optic really uh, set a very strong tone here, but that really gets flipped on its head when we move to Ascent um, uh, sort of go going forward here because, mm -hmm. uh, look, good start for Loud here, and they look really well drill drilled on this map. I think, uh, you know, this is where, uh, you know, I get a little bit concerned about, about Optic, especially 
Uh, look, the first half was pretty competitive here because this is the last round of the first half. I, I know this uh, This is an optic uh, round win here as they're able to repel through a lot of this utility through B-Main. Um, it's the second half that's where Optic shit the bed. <laughs> yeah, but before we even get to that second half, I I also have to commend like Optic on the first half and just in general of like how uh, drilled they're looking more. Uh, like, you know, in, in the interviews, the post-game interviews and, and stuff of that that we hear about Optic, of course, with spoilers if you haven't really watched it. But, uh, you know, FNS was saying we put a lot of hard work and effort into our uh, into our games. You know, the, the, the good old standard yada yada of like we practice hard, we work hard, and it, it shows off. It shows that it pays off. Uh, but the thing is, the things that they worked hard on, some of the things that I really liked, uh, I, especially when they're working on that catwalk side, there was this one play um, where I think it was on an eco. So you had... You had Victor and somebody else up on Catwalk playing against an, uh, a flash into the Omen smoke on Catwalk so that anybody that's coming up from loud into that smoke will get flash and forced to fall back. But then at the same time, Crash is going to or Owl Drone or Recon Guard towards the back of Catwalk outside of smoke so that those two guys inside that smoke were able to get kills from a scan and get away like very cleanly from an attack and not get killed and give them the round of uh, the player advantage. And I think even winning that round. So that type of drills, that type of like um, change that I've seen from, from optic that I haven't seen yet from like other teams from all the VODs that I've been watching of like, Oh shit, we're actually fighting inside smokes in a different way. Uh, it, it comes to show that the preparation that optic has put, was a lot more than just a general, hey, how do we take control of B? How do we take control of A side long yeah. and, and shit like that, right? So that's that's what I really liked. It, it was pretty interesting to me because Optic, it felt like the biggest like incremental advantage they had access to against Loud was that their mid-rounding was just better across the board. I think that like yeah. FNS really mm -hmm. showcased how good he is in IGL. Mm -hmm. And sort of supplementar uh, supplementary to that, I think that they sort of redefine themselves a bit. Like my biggest critique of them going into this event is that it felt like an overwhelming amount of their rounds coming out of the NA playoffs were one off the back of just like ludicrous hero plays. I mean, you've got Yay on the team, you've got Marbed on the team, Victor, like it's a suite of guys who are just going to make 1v3s, 1v4s happen sometimes. And they just sort of will rounds into existence when they shouldn't necessarily be occurring. But to the point that you just made, Vans, it felt like they came into this with a lot more creativity, a lot more like set trap That's plays. It, yeah. And it, yeah. it, it's interesting because specifically in the way that they created those trap plays, it's almost emulating that like hero play push through a smoke type situation that they found so much success in during their normal situations, mm -hmm. but standardizing it into the way that they operate at baseline. Like it's just a really, really excellent way of leveraging how they were already operating as a roster. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you had like Pankata win a three versus one, and then that just changed everything. <laughs> yeah. So I want I want to sort of tease that out a little bit more as we look at as we look at Icebox. We talk about this tangible advantage that Optic having that they're able to show this mid round calling, which I think was uh, mental in the grand final. I think we can dig into that a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. It's fucking insane. But what is it that allowed leveraging here to uh, allow them to be? <sighs> agnostic of this tactical <laughs> advantage that uh that optic sort of have here because optic get real close right this game gets to like 11 to 12 optic win three rounds in a row after having like a you know a bit of a weaker start to the second half uh and loud managed to force this through how the heck do they do this there's such a big factor <laughs> yeah it, it's there's such a big factor with uh the, the shot calling in, in a map like this one and you get to see it the, the fact that it was so close to you it was getting insane um uh, but but stepping up and, and i feel like that was something still that was missing from from sadak for example that i know that he could do more even in the impact ratings that ominous had um that he posted so the sadak they didn't have the best performance compared to what he does in VCT usually in Brazil. And that is the opposite to someone like FNS who was popping off in this grand finals, right? We saw him doing really well in, in all the matches that they played. Obviously, the team that played the most matches in, in Masters. But then uh, when we got to see in the grand finals, it was like a completely different player, completely online, ready to take those fights. And, and to come up in situations like that one where it's tough decisions, but it's optic always coming up on top. Yeah. It's it was definitely less than that in that icebox game, man. It's like fucking plus twenty, a bunch of fucking ADR. 
Uh, and and it's it's a tough issue too when when you're a team that wins both pistols. I think I think pistols did drive a lot of momentum for uh, any team that was actually playing against Optic Two. I think we'll talk about it a little bit later. But like when Zeta Division won their pistol rounds against Optic Two, that allowed them to to like get a good lead uh, on that first map series before Optic was able to come back later on. But yeah, it was definitely a, a force that Optic had a hard time getting through. Um, and, and less is defense. Um, basically on, on on this map i think I, I can't remember the game fully but let's less like uh, 30 kills 30 exactly. something <laughs> i think he had as much impact as he had on defense as he had on offense too so it yeah was I, good, I remember it was like round game. seven yeah. and he was 15 and one it, it was insane <laughs> yeah yeah it was fucking yeah. insane um so this sort of solidifies to me like maybe well Funny, like Optic had a habit of of really bouncing back and actually beating opponents that handled them. So I think a yeah. lot of people were still saying, okay, well, this team never loses in the same way uh, to the same team. Uh, it's sort of twice. So, I mean, this mm -hmm. is 33 and 13, by the way. What yeah. is it? I've seen this lately. Viper players getting fuck tons of frags uh, on <laughs> Icebox. Who, who the fuck was Oh, God. What game was I watching? I think it must have been an EMEA game or something like that. But it's been happening a fair bit later. But look, 375 ACS, pretty fucking astonishing stuff. Optic get knocked down a lower bracket. They're still in it, but I think at this point, uh, loud stonks are pretty high. Um, mm. That raw individual ability is really on, on show, which is honestly like something that has characterized their region for so long. Right? I think in so many uh, games in top FPS titles, you know, Brazil have just had just cracked out uh, mechanics. Zeta versus PRX is a really it divides the community in a big way. A lot of people want to believe in the in the Zeta Vision narrative going forward, especially after they dispatched the RX. From start from the start of the tournament to now, have we seen an evolution from Zeta Division? Because I didn't oh, yeah. really believe in them until they beat DRX. Honestly, they it was Mickey Mouse stuff. They beat what NIP. They beat Fanatic, Fanatic and then yeah. what Liquid. So not convinced until that match. So. What happens to Zeta Division over the course of this tournament? Uh, I mean, Anders, you want to start, and then I'll uh, I'll piggyback off you. Sure. I. It's interesting because I don't necessarily think it was it was strictly an evolution during this tournament. I think that there's been like a lot of sort of cross pollination between like the APAC teams, the Korean teams, and the Japanese teams, and I think that it got to the point where. In terms of like raw aim talent, I think that Japan has probably been one of the better, if not the best, regions in that like Asian collective of regions mm -hmm. uh, for a long while. And it's mostly been their fundamentals and their overall macro strategy that's been acutely suffering. And you had that interview with Laz where he went along like the entire narrative where like DRX is basically a big brother to them because they scrim so much and they're so helpful. I feel like DRX sort of imparted a lot of that macro strategic ability on a team that ultimately had better base mechanics than them and turned them into a better team than DRX was capable of handling. Mm -hmm. Like it's it's quite incredible just the the base skill like all else being equal from each of the players on Zeta is pretty spectacular. And then when you start adding that core of fundamentals, the things that they're sort of getting from these scrims with DRX, and then evolving that through international experience, like it's going to be hard to handle these these players. Like we yeah. constantly talk about the rotation and the churn in North American and EMEA teams of like, oh, this is their first international land. Well, Zeta Division's been to every single like some of these players have been to multiple international lands. They have experience from CS. Like these are tenured players who you're not going to worry about that execution in the moment. They've now got the fundamentals and the macro strategy to go with their aim. Like they're the full package. It just took a while That's to put thing. it all together. That's the thing. I think I think that they've definitely gotten an upgrade for Zeta Division with uh, with the players that they recently picked up in that roster when that roster blew up. Like Waz and Crow stayed, but then they picked up Depp, they picked up Sugar Zero, and then they picked up Ten. And I uh, and Sugar Zero is probably one of the best smokers of the event outside of Marv for me um so that that was like one of the players that really shined for that team for zeta division overall uh but then uh, as, when you have that roster and then on top of that as anders has mentioned before the scrim partners that they have is consistently towards drx so now you're able to build like uh, a little bit more depth in terms of okay 
we already know like the good synergy of DRX of how they play the game. And because Zeta Division is exposed to that very often by having a permanent scrim partner as DRX, then now they're also able to develop that type of synergy and teamwork. And going into the second map on Haven, where they actually plowed PRX was a, a true definition of that type of teamwork. I, I I remember this one round with like Sugar Zero and I can't remember who was the second player. I think it was Crow or something like that. But they, they pull up like a, a fake bubble from the Astra so that the uh, the second player could actually get in and then they're just retaking on a two-player site on like a two versus four. Like they looked very, very good uh, for Zeta Division uh, in terms of how they played the retakes, how they traded together, um, they were a lot more aggressive too, in a sense. Where you know, and, and I gotta say, composed is like pick an angle. You're you're fighting for a first shot. If you're actually not getting the kill, you're not trying to re-swing back. You're falling back into a different position where you have another different crossfire for the team, uh, or set up rather a, as a team. And uh, it just it just turned out to be very very good there against uh, against Paper X. I look. I'll be honest with you. I'm I'm astounded because this map. This, this Haven map was atrocious for Zeta Division uh, in the past. And last week we said yeah. in, in, a best of, in a best of five, like uh, in a map pool that, you know, put Zeta in a position where they can only ban that Ascent, that Insta-ban of theirs, how are they going to, how are they going to sort of get through? And then they just come out here and fucking flog PRX. <laughs> I, like, what the heck? I, like I said, they, they just look very good in, in terms of like how they can play the retakes too, because they've done some very similar things uh, against Optic in uh, in that uh, matchup in the lower finals. I think that maybe Zeta getting smacked on the uh, on like the the last Haven matches that we've watched was basically just maybe trying to get the feel uh, back at it on the international stage. But they've definitely shown to me that they're uh, they're a force to be reckoned with here on uh, on on Haven. I uh, I was astonished to see this. Um, I because I think this is definitely where we sort of pointed out where that they would would struggle. What's going on with PRX in this in this series? Because Vance, you're the only person, you're honestly the only person <laughs> on the show at the time who who really thought that Zeta could win this game. Everyone else was like, "Oh, look, you know, it's been a pretty great run for for Zeta. Yeah, that win over DRX was big, but there's always an asterisk, right? The, the yeah. asterisk for the DRX game was because they were fucking mentally boomed out by Optic. So yeah. You know, no one is really, you know, expecting them to to do what they do here, but winning 13 2 on this particular yeah. map. I think Mind Freak is like 3 and 14 on the Omen uh, yeah. on this map. Like, a fucking, it's just, it's just awful. Um, what, uh, well, especially at the, the play style that PRX has, uh, most most recently that I've been watching at Masters was they try to leverage Bankai a lot on like these lurk plays and like the, the late, the late flanks or even on the late lurks on the attack. And I think Zeta Division also identifies that too. Like even if you're looking at this example right now on a 12-2 scoreline, like look where, where Bank is, is. He's already ready for a flank ready to cut rotation and not really pushing forward on on some of the moments, but that allows Zeta Division to really press forward into like just fighting into the site, knowing that there's going to be one less player to to worry about because it's always going to be Bankai lurking somewhere. Uh, and, and it shows that not only on how much better they look as a team. They definitely come in with a lot of preparation as well. I think we, uh, for me, most definitely, I've underrated uh, Zeta Division in terms of how they could fare against, like, uh, strategically against other teams. And uh, the aim was always there, as Anders mentioned before. Yeah. But now that you have that with the uh, the uh, the in-depth studying tape of your opponents and putting that into fruition, Zeta Division is is here to stay. Do we have a verdict on the fucking Rainer on Haven, people? Um, oh, <laughs> I mean, it's Jing. Jing's still pretty dope. I mean, you, but... you could just you could just say, "What's the verdict on Rain on any map?" And it's just <laughs> bad. Don't do it. it the, yeah. the thing about it is that is that paper rakes are able to get away with a lot of things, but they shouldn't. And I feel like they realize that now. And I and I feel like it's not only them, but other regions that we've seen kind of running crazy things that they realize that they have to shut it down. And I, that is also why I give credit to, to Zeta, because they were really able to read uh, the aggression and the, the play style that Paper Rex was bringing. It was something that at that point, it just becomes so predictable. Like, okay, you're going to be running the Reina, but how much value can you actually get out of this Reina? Yeah. And they obviously they they will run your room on on uh, bind if mm. they can. So this is a team that is really pushing the envelope. I feel like 
But like their, their luck, uh, we, we don't have to call it luck, I guess. I guess their rope runs out a little bit here. Um, let's talk about Split, because Paper Rex win both pistols in this map. Uh, and still, uh, spoilers, they pull up short. Uh, look, Forsaken has a, a pretty decent game. Like that's sort of, you know, I don't think that that's really an issue here. But, uh, you know, it's a back and forth first half. It's a 6-6 six, six half time. And then uh, Paper Rex win the pistol in the second half. And then their defense rounds start to fall apart. What is this Seder division uh, attack side? Uh, go ahead, Anders. I mean, it, it, it honestly boils down to the fact that they are playing an incredibly, incredibly well-controlled play style that teams, I feel like, have sort of forgotten existed a little. They're like coming off of patch 404. I feel like everyone's just like, oh, we don't have to worry about Astra anymore. It's fine. Just, just don't worry about it. And then Zeta comes out and they're like, oh, we're going to play Astra, Sage, Viper, and we're just going to play this obscenely toxic entrenchment setup on defense and then we get to it uh when we get to attack it's going to be like really really heavy util setups and we also have this sort of like slightly aberrant adaptation of having a sky in our comp so we have really good mid-round info tools and like we're just going to have dynamism and these sort of suffocating execs that people are going to assume haven't are like no longer viable because people have stopped playing them like they're right. they're playing they're leaning into a play style that feels antiquated, but still has so much power left in it that they're converting that on it this to a tremendous Astra usage effect. still? Hmm? Does that have, how much does that have to do with their, their continued sort of use of Astra here? I would say the majority of it, to be honest. Okay, I think okay. that the, the two sort of pivot points that really differentiate them from the rest of the pool is the Astra that they're using and the Sky that they're using. Yeah. Those two pieces, like you don't see many other teams do them. It In terms of the slow. Sky, I think it's like right. the Guard uses Sky, so like yeah. them and that's it. And the Astra, it's like maybe one in four teams roughly are still right. using it. Yeah. I also think it's also PRX going very old school with their comp as well. <laughs> uh, like the double duelist, like this is also like beta, beta comp pretty much. Right. Double duelist, Sage, Cypher, that the Cypher and Omen could still be pretty good on, on uh, setting up like the trap informations that you want on heaven side and then all the one way smokes that you could currently do uh, on, on this, uh, on this map as Omen. But Mind Freak also, you know, we talked about his results on that second map, but his results on the third map hasn't been that great either. So um, there, there's been there's been a lack, a little bit of performances on PRX to be able to help out to 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 close out uh, like the third map, especially as you mentioned, Uber, when they've won both pistols. But I think Zeta is again on their defender uh, defender side. It's just like Haven, where you overpower uh, so much uh, against your opponents on defense that Benkai is trying to do heroic plays on his own because he has to clutch like a three versus one because his yeah. teammates aren't alive for, for uh, enough time for him to actually get those flanks through the, through the mid ropes. I mean, Mind Freak is minus 23 on that series. Uh, he He's just not able to have a lot of impact on that omen, right? <clears throat> Especially those, those sort of last couple of maps. This, I mean, I, I, every time I see Split come up, I, you know, I'm very scared of Zeta Division now, basically <laughs> in, in perpetuity, um, yeah. what they're able to sort of do on this map. Um, we don't have the fucking highlighter shit. I mean, anyone could look to see what who's at the bottom and fucking draw it. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not great. Um, and for Paper X, it's a disappointing end for like a team that you know. I think a lot of people maybe expected to win that particular matchup. And and this, the narrative, uh, the story of Zeta Division is still alive, right? Um, mm -hmm. the way that they turn this series around and the way that they punish Paper X because they just don't. You know, they they lose those both those pistols and still able to make it happen. Now we see this lower final, uh, and I think a lot of people are thinking, okay, uh, you know, Optic have just suffered loss at the hands of Loud. It wasn't it was fairly close, right? Mm. Um, but a lot of people are like they're running into a team with momentum, right, falling down to this lower bracket against Zeta Division. The momentum they had in Spades at the start of the series. We go to Haven again, a map we expect to be weaker for Zeta Division. They put five rounds on the board uh, off the rip. Really good start here for Zeta Division. Just like Optic are uh, perpetually, uh, you know, and many of these maps having to start from like a three to five round deficit at times here, yeah. and they have to do it again. It's still special yeah, I feel like I, I feel like I never saw 
um the the same amount of rounds being lost right at the beginning from any of the the tournaments that we've seen so far yeah. the international ones it was insane and i mean obviously it, it's just so rely reliant on on the economy and then taking advantage which is something that we saw Seda doing in the lower bracket over and over again they really understand that and understood the wind condition early on uh but on this map again it was just after you get a little bit more after the sixth round that's when we get to see things even but and it gets risky i saw um the people talking about it too how how much that score is leaning towards a single team towards the beginning and then we start seeing the actual match that we're expecting mm -hmm. it was it was definitely marv man marv kept them in the game marv saved them from the game too like there's been so many moments in this game where uh He's able to kill somebody that cuts him a rotation. I think it was Depp that allows him to plant towards the seaside when they had a numbers disadvantage. Another time where it's like a two versus four on seaside, they try to do an execution. It doesn't work out. Marv has a TP, goes over to the A site, and I think Crashies was the other one that was alive, if I'm not mistaken, and they win like a two versus four. Like there was so many clutch moments that came out of Marv that kept them in the game uh, right in this first map. And I feel that, uh, you know, this was Optic's map pick. And then Zeta Division was able to bring this into overtime. I mean, they should have closed it off because it was, what, a 12-9, 12-10 scoreline at some point as well. Uh, but it, it just it just fell short because of that. But it, it did put, like, a, a little bit of a scare uh, as, a, as an Optic fan to see how the rest of the series is going to go with how Zeta looked um, pretty, pretty well composed from the pistol round up into the five first rounds that we've got in a row. But if it wasn't for those heroic plays and those clutch moments, because there was another one of like a two versus four between FNS and Marv, I think, for this round. Yeah, it was this one round right here where they, they won the overtime round because they were able to get into the B side and Marv gets his kill because he's on top B. And then that's another crucial kill that he gets. I don't know, man. Marv, Marv was, for me, uh, the MVP of the last two matches uh, yeah. overall for uh, for Optic. Insane young bloke, obviously, but it's just insane composure. Mm -hmm. uh, think about where this guy sort of came from, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that FaZe Clan team where, honestly, he had to be the most consistent player on that roster. Too. While IGLing. <laughs> yep. Just, I mean, he he was so well groomed for, for this sort of role on, on Optic, as it turns out. This is a team, though, that we, that we sort of... I'll come back to this question after we talk about the final as well. But this is the team, Anders, that you were fairly critical about, saying that they feel like they lent a lot on the individual. This 35 kill game from Marv feels like it might be similar to that. <laughs> yeah. <What do> you... <laughs> I mean, like, my critique of them being, like, very reliant on individual plays hasn't changed. I think okay. that they've just got such insane individuals that they can get away with it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's one of yeah. those things where, like, Saying that they rely heavily on individuals isn't necessarily a detraction on their team. It's just their play style. And if sure. you have the firepower to do it, then more power to you. But Literally, this wasn't how we characterized their, winning against, uh, their game against Loud, though, was it? We characterized their game against Loud on, on mid-rounding mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. more, hey, more than anything. So. And also, if you're talking about heroic plays, you're also just usually coining that around just yay, right? But then yeah. when you look at the rest of the roster throughout this Masters for Optic, they all had their moments, you know, when... You've got four players making hero plays per match. It feels like exactly. it's more palatable exactly. to us, though, if it's someone not yay that is carrying the team, right? Yeah. It almost feels like it's framed in less of a one-man carry situation if it's Marv or someone else smokes or something mm. like that, you know what I mean? And, and Victor had the moment where he just popped off this tournament, too. I think he played very, very well, mm. and especially going back to that first map against Zeta Division, where I, I, I wanted to praise Zeta Division on the good... Um, studying that they've been doing on, against our opponents they've done a great job actually shutting down like the a site control of optic over onto uh onto the choke so victor wasn't able to yeah. get the the best value out of the uh yeah he's possibly getting up. flashed that early round right exactly he's like having to run away most fault of the line time. from the breach also from the from the a link so that he can't really get the full chart uh the full sprint what's down he trying to do it long a anyway on, just, on defense like what's that what's the plan i think you know, there's a lot of that that control that you have from getting the corner of like you know when like the omen does a teleporter uh into yep. into the a long side that little nook yeah, now yeah. you're able to do that with the sprint but at the same time trying to get some concuss into like the long orb so you can actually add a lot of pressure going into that side and catch your opponent off guard off the timing side we always say that neon's able to do so i think that was like the the big thing that zeta was able to shut down where again you rely on other people this time and uh and um marv was one of that on haven so 
now we, we talk I mean, about fracture here though so yeah uh, why they pick fracture so so uh, so obviously zeta you know have had a decent fracture right but you know going up against optic you ban ascent that's fine optic ban breeze right so both teams get rid of their perma bands why i, I kind of wonder why you sort of don't just pick split here and, and, and maybe try and get a, a map that you feel really good on you know out of the way because it feels like looking at this map pool um mm. with the exception of fracture which is good the only maps that i felt were like really good for for zeta division and not so good for optic were at the end of the series like icebox and split felt like there were maps where like zeta division could actually start to lean into their strength on those maps a little bit but haven fracture bind for the first three felt uh, a little scary for zeta or at least those first two so why do you think they pick fracture i mean have you guys even thought about that does it is it relevant I I've think... thought about it a lot, honestly. <laughs> like a lot, because I'm I'm like a I'm gonna hyper analyze the shit out of a map ban whenever I have the opportunity yeah, yeah. to. And of course, of course. So I think that if I was them, I really wanted to pick split here, but I don't want to start attack, and so splits out of the runs. And okay, cool. I expect that if I pick icebox, that exact that's exactly what optic expected me to do, and so they're gonna be hard prepped for my icebox um because if i were to do like the map hierarchy yeah, that's exactly as it goes like i think icebox yeah. is probably zeta's best map sure and so the the inclination is immediately going to be to go to icebox but i then have to say all right optics going to come in here anti-stratting every single thing that i have in my playbook so either we've got to reinvent ourselves here and potentially have it not be our best map anymore and still sort of gamble on it um or wager that they're not going to be prepped efficiently which i just don't think is a safe call and if we choose split, which is probably our second best map, we're starting on the disadvantaged side and we have to be able to keep our composure, <laughs> potentially already being oh. down a map in the series. So they have and to play so... Haven and fucking Bind in the first three. It's, it's <laughs> so brutal for these guys, man. They have I, to win I, Fracture or they're I, fucked. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they still had a pretty decent Fracture against other teams I, too, right? Yeah. If I would have gone split, to, honestly. Of if I was them, of course, I would have been course. set. I would have said, I don't care if I have to start attack, give me split in this mm -hmm. position of the yeah. map. Ban every single time. But I, 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 I definitely see, I, uh, like, you, Anders, you mentioned Icebox. For me, it was probably split where I see Zeta Division, like, the most comfortable on uh, with how they played. And it was just, like, fun to see, like, some of the maps that are able to knock out their opponents is on like a, a map in japan and like you have all that pride in it too so you want to make sure you're good on that map which is actually pretty fun to to, to see but i i feel that when you're looking at zeta <laughs> division exactly when you're looking at zeta division versus optic it also looks uh, looking at their comp i feel like it's still pretty decent right to play against uh, an agent that could get these off timings uh with with victor's neon when you're when you're trying to sprint in what do you have to stop them like you have snake bites on the ground, a poison orb for the K. Mm. You have a fault line. You have gravity wells. You have concussions from the Nova pulses. You have fucking pain shells. You have fucking turrets on the ground. You have so much shit to, to spot out where your neon's going to be, but also ways to slow her down on the hits into, uh, into the sites. But I feel that the opposite happened. I feel that Optic had way better utility usage versus Zeta Division into the late rounds. The beginning of the rounds, it was great. It was like a great chess match from both of the teams where great utility was being uh, used in the first like 10 seconds, and then it was like a stalemate. Then everybody had to default and, and work a lot more slowly into the sites. But there was this round, I think it was round number, uh, when it was like 11 for Optic, and they're about to get to 12, and they're playing a pulse plant uh, onto the A site. And you had FNS that was still alive, you had Crashies that was still alive, and he had uh, Victor that was still alive. And when it was a three versus two, not giving a chance for the last two players to retake the site because FNS had a rolling thunder. He throws a rolling thunder into spawn side. Then you have a KO knife from Crashies, then followed by uh, the fucking relay bolts from Neon. So they can't even get out of the site. And then after that, a flash comes out, then a fault line. And then the fucking blaze, uh, the wall that comes out from Neon. So the amount of utilities that, that Optic had to not allow uh, Zeta Division to play the retake was definitely like, oh shit, this is like a a, a rude awakening that <laughs> Zeta Division weren't ready for. And Anders, like we, we talked about it last time too, looking at this comp for Optic, what was good for this team is that with this comp, or not necessarily the team, but the comp in itself, it's just a lot of suppression, a lot of utility that you're using to like just overpower your opponents on retakes that could also be good on pulse plant situations.
There, there was an interview too that where Victor said that he just feels like no one really has a, the right idea of how to counter the neon properly and how to counter the composition that they like to play in Fracture, and that is what is helping them out so much. And like you mentioned, Vance, it's just the utility usage is such a massive difference, and even with a composition like we see from Reseda, where it's supposed to in paper slow them down, and it's just. Yeah. It just seems like it's not enough. Like teams don't have enough time to review them, not have enough information on how to actually slow it down, even if you're playing a composition that should be doing it on paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there anything to do with controls getting toned down a bit? Because it feels like in so many of these yeah. situations. The answer is actually really obvious and easy to, to leverage. I'm shocked that teams haven't done it yet because, like, it's kind of obvious when you think about it. Like, ne Neon is a, is a weird, weird character to have to deal with. And it's one of the things that, like, when I look at Neon in compositions, I'm like, right, give me an agent draft, please, please. I can just hard counter this every time I see it. People are going to have to last cycle it against me if they ever want to get away with that nonsense. But Neon has some very, very blatant counters that we've already seen leveraged on Fracture to very high success. It's just a matter of teams putting two and two together and realizing that it's their direction that they need to go. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I think... We see Optic try and make use of her to play ahead of a lot of this utility and frustrate Astra, especially. Seems like Astra can't quite erect the sort of defensive construct she needs in the face of the speed that, that Neon can sort of bring. Is that accurate? Or is, Yeah, so, is that... so if you think about it, Neon is so fast that with her dash, she's going to be able to circumvent your stars. Your suck is not yeah. going to get off in time to be able to stop her. Yeah. Your Neon can dash past your chamber trips. She's not only going to be able to circumvent the chamber trips, but she's going to pull the slow field so far away from the rest of her team that you've now disabled that chamber trip in terms of its efficacy for that entire bottleneck. So yeah. you've got two components in Zeta's comp that are the most important in terms of their ability to entrench sites that are completely invalidated by the yep. Neon. And if you look at the other side of the coin, oh, if I was in their position, what would I be running there? All right, so I'm probably still running the Astra, but I'm running it with something like a Cypher because you're either going to have to kill that Cypher trip or your Neon's going to run straight into it. I'm probably prepping against Optic. I'm saying, all right, this is the Neon's typical routing. I'm just going to do one-off ground, uh, like on low-to-the-ground kill trips that just hard cut off Victor's pathing. I'm just going to completely punish the hell out of him, and I'm only going to use my Neon utility to try and sort of uh, detach and segment off the rest of his team and I'm going to break their follow-up. That's what you're going to stop there. And then the other easy answer to address is if you want to go more the route of like a Gambit-style comp on Fracture, Sagewall just booms Neon. Yeah. Like, it, it's a hard wall in her way. How is she going to dash through it? She can't. Like, it's it. you have to look at the tools that Neon doesn't have a way to directly and immediately break with just the standard operating premises of her kit. If I can dash past something and make it basically useless, it's probably not going to be great against me. Shocker. So it's a hard, hard counter to uh, Neon and Edge Dancers, if you like Sanderson novels. Um, can we, what about Bind then, as it, come, as, as it comes up in map number three here? This is not like a auspicious map for Zeta Division, right? I think this is only the second time they play Bind uh, in this whole tournament. Uh, they, they generally are sort of able to avoid it. And Icebox is, it's just waving at them in the distance as it fades away. Uh, you know, Optic start with a, a really nice 8-4 half, right? Uh, some really nice attacking rounds, a lot of pressure here. Um, sort of tell us about sort of how Zeta try and fight their way back or, or sort of the kind of pressure that Optic can put on here, Vance. I'll, I'll ask you, I don't know if you've, you, you've sort of seen all of this in detail, but I felt like Optic were really starting to lean into Zeta Division. And Zeta got really frustrated not being able to slow them down in the last map. And it seems to be the case here. Like these hits are just so hard to uh, get untangled, especially as they hit that A site. I think the only time where they actually found some success was when they wanted to change the the speed a bit because Optic had control of the map the whole time. They were, they 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 had the control of the pacing of the map of of the attacker side, and then finally Zeta Division decides to push out and then fight into the extremities with a trap play, and it works out in a bit. But after that, when you're looking at uh, how Optic has been playing on this map overall, you would think that the utility that you have from Zeta Division would be good enough because the comp for me is. I, I kind of like it. It's it's still like the the good old standard smokes, good walls you could have with the sage plant, and then play like the the pulse plant if you can. But there's also just the uh, the sheer firing power that you have from from Victor uh, on this map for Ye on this map. Uh, that's just been too much for for Zeta Division. Uh, when it comes down to dueling and winning your fights, Optic still had the upper hand throughout the whole throughout the whole series here against Zeta Division. 
it's uh you know for optic i feel like this is the kind of team that only sort of it's a bit like goku really they get sort of slapped down and they they really seem to be able to come back with, with something new every time and, you know, and it's and it's funny because the, the the perception of this team, uh, you know, was you know, as we talked about, very individualistic, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and Chet's a memer, so I think people underestimated him because he's just his speaking register. And uh, you, we'll have him on the show. You'll kind of see what I mean. He's really just so understated uh, as a person. But this is this is not. I don't feel like this is a close map, honestly. I feel like this is really dominant stuff from Optic in the way that Zeta sort of exits the tournament. It's a sad ending for for Zeta who. Fuck me. I mean, like in the lower bracket, they get through Liquid, DRX, Paper X. Uh, and Optic just seems to be too strong. And this is where I feel like Optic is hitting their stride. It feels like they're really peaking at the right time. Yeah, definitely. They they peaked. I like, I mean, I'm glad that they peaked at the right time because their first game was already a loss for against Xertia, where, where it's like, oh shit, here we go again. They're gonna <laughs> lose against SEA slash X10 and it and we're just gonna see Optic flop. But I'm glad that they they turned that over, and when they turned that over, they turned that with with sheer confidence throughout the rest of the tournament. So, super happy how that turned out for Optic. So, you guys have three words to characterize Zeta Division's run through Masters. Okay, you you can pick three words, mm. uh, and no more than that. All right, we can, we can talk a little bit about the region as well. But Vans, you have to go first here. Oh fuck! Right, with man. three words, three fucking words. Come on, you know words, right? You know more than oh, ten, I'd say. What? What? Yeah. Oh man, now I'm gonna squat on that big way. face too. Looks good. Thanks, Look man. Your camera. Yo, that's what why I, I was just saying that in the chat before too, and the, uh, talking to the production. I was like, oh shit, I finally have a good connection. That I, I'm full screen a lot compared to all all the other shows that I've done from Vietnam so far. But if this I had is to, a great opportunity for you to say something smart. I think. <sighs> I, I don't think so, man. Me smart, never gonna happen. But I, I, I just, in the simplest words, probably great for Japan, right? In those three words. Uh, just because, uh, like I've mentioned in my tweets, I think now in Attack FPS, Zeta Division has gone the furthest out of like any other FPS that currently exists uh, for Japan. Like I think that the best run that I've seen was Nora Rango in Rainbow Six for, for Siege Invitational in like 2019 or 2018, I can't really remember. But then after that, they, that, that team kind of fell apart with some drama. Uh, but then it, it's nice to see that Zeta division from last year at the beginning of the year until now, like the immense growth that they've, that they've gotten as, as a team. And when you're looking at the watch parties that you had from Japan out there, the, the fan base, that's all behind Zeta division. And for them to get even a metal finish, like a, a top three finish. I think that's fucking amazing. That's another mm -hmm. three words right there. Yeah, good job. I mean, uh, look, look at this. Look at this fucking. All right, all right, Hermione Granger. I didn't fucking ask you to, to, to exceed the requirements here. Just, just meet them for one. Uh, and it's three words, mate. Oh man, I'm gonna take a very different spin on it. A very, very different spin on it. And my like three words are gonna be just keep improving, because mm -hmm. that's the narrative of both. That, that's the message I want to give Japan as a region coming off of this event and the message that I think best represents this performance. Every single event that, the, that Japan as a region has showed up to, they never stop closing the gap between themselves and the quote-unquote major regions. And if they continue the trajectory that they're on, like, I can't wait for champions, man. It's going to be insane. Like, if, if they can stay on this this overall story arc of them as a region improving and parring these, these regions that supposedly have so much greater resources than them and have such a greater like uh pedigree and past and other tactical fps's i mean sky's the limit that's that's all you can really say about it yeah damn you guys all have a bunch of th three word statements that's great what have you got <laughs> what have you got dryad three words. yeah I, I would say it's a little bit of that historic and inspirational narrative that we had going on from them right because yeah and i say inspirational because it not only it was really nice to watch but it can mean so much for the region now like we've been talking about it can mean and it can increase uh the level the skill everything and even more people wanting wanting to play knowing that it's actually possible for japan something that we'd never saw before and valorant yeah. being such a new game uh it, it can it's a, it's a crucial point so that is why i think it's it's so nice uh truly uh historic as well inspirational uh for that and it it leaves everyone excited of what can be of the rest of international events and i feel like people are even talking about it this is only three words by the way but uh, <laughs> People are talking about, about uh, how much they would like to watch Japan now in Korea yeah. if they had some, well, they, there's the Korean English stream, but for Japan, mm. the English stream and how much 
more likely people are willing to to watch even if it's late at night or whatever it is because yeah it, it caught it caught attention people are interested now yeah absolutely it's all fun and games you have to stay up till fucking 3 a.m but vans is living that life right now my yeah, it's three good. words to describe zeta division's run are get fucked korea Boom. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, in, in all oh seriousness, my. my three words are no minor regions, except for Oceania, because, uh, you know, that was, uh. honestly, that was the, de- <laughs> sorry guys, that was the discussion uh, a lot in the lead up to this, like, how do we sort of grade these regions and we keep sort of comparing and contrasting them to one another, and I think last year in Iceland, we saw, um, I guess a narrative that enforced this idea, because we were playing very heavily in the post-plant meta, and the teams that were not quite on that train yet, just looked a lot worse and they made themselves look even worse by making a mid like vikings let's use them for example mm. they, they took a mid-tournament switch and tried to play post plant and couldn't get there in time and so it made everyone else feel like oh well look you know we have our like major regions and, and you know everyone else is still you know their understanding of the metagame is not really there but you know i really do feel like that barrier has been eliminated there are differences in in in, in region right we were just talking about Zeta Division's sort of desire to play, you know, these compositions that, that feature that Astra, you know, I want to play yeah. a little bit more defensively, but it's still got them uh, so far. And we know they can turn up the speed, can, can turn up the heat when they sort of have to. So, uh, yeah, really, really impressive stuff. I think, uh, you know, North America have bought themselves a stay of execution. We're not going to get rid of all your slots here, but um, <laughs> I think it's, it's just sick for the game that people give a fuck about, you know, what Japan's doing, what SCA is doing. The- uh, I th- yeah, I think that the story is so nice for the for the minor regions, like you said, because it, it's crazy that we even started with a narrative in the p- first place, knowing that the game is, you know, the competitive scene, especially in international events, it's only one year, this first event that we get in 2022. And I mean, anything can happen. Anyone can be at the top. We already proved it in every way possible throughout, you know, what we saw last year to what we saw in this event. We had a narrative going on in the Latin American stream where, it was, you know, the meta's not shaped by a single region, it's not shaped by NA, by EU, it's shaped by what everyone is bringing to the table and the individual plays as well that are making the difference. We saw it uh, for Paper Rec, especially crazy compositions, but it was working out to some extent. It was working out for them and, and we see it in every single way possible where there, there's a highlight and there's a there's a clear indication that there's not a specific meta that everyone's going to be running. Not everyone is going to be copying EU. Not everyone is going to be copying uh, Gamut and the strategies that they've brought when they were playing bct every and the, the coaches deserve a huge credit for that everyone is coming up with different things and they're working out in the international scene and that's just all that really matters yeah. this, hey, this here, game here. is in such good shape man i i am yeah. so i just want exactly. to exactly i'm extremely jealous because we have like we have a little bit, uh, you know, Overwatch, we have a little bit of like you know south america uh, latin representation but there's not, nothing it's there's not nothing there. <laughs> It's just, Here's it's, it's so, uh, well, the closest thing we had, honestly, is Alamon playing for the fucking Boston Uprising. Christ, you know, yeah. and Japan, like we are, we, there were, Japan had like a blip on the radar while the 2018, 19 World Cup in Sydney, but we, we just not, we call ourselves a global esport, but we're not accessing those regions. I think they're just so, so important. So yeah, I, I hope think, that changes. I hope yeah, that changes. If there's, we'll, if there's one thing that's missing though, and I think that we could add another three words to that is. Mm-hmm masters with spectators i think that should become a hashtag i think that should be fucking sick to witness hopefully yeah. we're gonna get it for masters too because a crowd uh we're gonna have international fans flying wherever it's going to be to be able to cheer for all of these teams. I mean, and i think it's mate, gonna be super fun i was got watching people on me- twitter like george gettys he's still confused why people fucking had a go at him for being mad that they weren't allowing crowds into these events some people yeah. still don't quite understand why this is happening uh yeah. but all we can do is hope that it's not going to be like this for very long because look, I will say though, I think that it's harder to put on a sick tech show when you are in a venue that's made for a crowd. There are tons of like technical limitations. So all I'd suggest is that your crowds are in my opinion, the epitome, the apex of the esports viewing experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. just don't maybe expect quite the same um, because they have such a, a uh, sort of contaminant free environment you know like it's such a sanitized right environment where they can do this stuff yeah, 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 we've yeah. seen riot put on incredible stage shows before with crowds but it, it's harder so i just would suggest that expectations are like you know reasonable <laughs> i mean <laughs> coming into that era you know all right look we've got a ton of talk about today 
so do we have to move on but uh dan thank you so much for coming on the show nice to get to pick your brain again as well and uh obviously congrats on, uh, uh actually okay you might stay cool all right because uh we have uh we have five people for our next segment including you so i have chat on the show so okay. stick around uh, and hope the rest of you do as well. You'll be able to uh, check us out, of course, on YouTube. If you uh, haven't caught all this far, you want to catch the rest of it at Valoranting. Twitter at Valoranting as well. We'll spam your feed with updates, especially, uh, you know, if you want to get little snippets from the show, if you can't catch it at the time. We're on Instagram and TikTok at Valoranting underscore DNP. And we're at DNP here on Twitch. After Watch. the break, we're getting Chet in here. That's right. It's going to be four on one. We're going to grill the man, the myth, the legend, of course, Masters winning coach for Optic Gaming. So don't go too far. We'll be back with Chet after the break. If you've been enjoying Valoranting, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you get every episode hot off the presses. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, on the other side of the break. We've got the same crew here on board, of course, and as we've got Dan Dryad and Van Silly. And we've been joined by Chet Singh, of course, victorious coach returning home. I recognize that dresser anywhere, mate. Yeah. How's the jet lag treating you? You must have, uh, you must have uh, had a pretty long journey. Uh, you know, everything's been pretty smooth. I have no complaints. Just, just jet lag. That's all I got right now. Yeah, sure. Um, let's kick this off, man. Uh, I want to talk about just the event in general. I think, uh, obviously like, you know, you, you've been around the Valorant scene for uh, since the very beginning at, at this point now, and you've been a part of, uh, you've been a part of some really high profile teams. Uh, I, I kind of, you know, want to get your feeling on how it felt sort of walking out there for that final and, and sort of what the setup was like. Cause obviously man. No crowd is a bit of a different vibe, yeah. Um, but obviously, like you know, the walk-ins were kind of epic. They really rolled out the you know the, the the big guns, I think, in terms of production there. But how are you feeling in those minutes, those seconds before the match kicks off? And how's the how's the atmosphere? Uh, honestly, the the last walkout, the song was like so cool. I I respect them for pulling out like a new song. That was actually sick. I even asked them for the song <laughs> after, so I'm still waiting on that. I'll listen to that again. Uh, I thought I, you were ready to dance there, dude. Uh, so for that match specifically, I have like more uh, final experience from like Counter Strike than my teammates. So yeah, going, yeah, true. Going, <laughs> going into that, uh, like my nerves were fine, and I think uh, I try to communicate that with my teammates to not like like stay and compose and don't freak out. And I think FNS did a good job saying that too, to stay composed mm -hmm. and no yelling needed. If anything, I yelled more than them. And I'm not even known for yelling. <laughs> so I was just trying to keep it hype while they like stay composed. Well, I mean, what was... Go, go ahead, sorry. No, but... you go, Vans. I've got plenty more. No, I, I just wanted to check like the, the game plan going into to this matchup as well. Because the last time you guys played against Loud, I mean, you guys had a great fracture. But then, you know, Ascent, we talked about the Pankata 3 versus 1. Uh, you know, how how... How great your defense has always been so far. So first off, I got to praise you about the the whole uh, setup, the work that you guys have put in into your defensive setups. But on your attacker side, there's still moments where you still rely a lot on like not necessarily only gay, but just somebody to pop off to keep the, the round alive for the team. So uh, so what what's been going on? What was the what was the game plan going into uh, the grand finals here against Loud, knowing the the weaknesses here of Fucking your attack? Straight sides? in, man. It's Fucking hell. Like every map. Fuck yeah. Uh, I don't want to like I don't want to like say exactly how we anti them because I don't want them to like fix whatever they had. Of course, of course. Yeah, I'll of course. Just, stay I'll, broke. Yeah, I'll just uh, generalize it, I guess. Uh, yeah. Yep. We definitely noticed like like I I anti like a lot. So when I was watching them, I like look for certain tendencies that they had. And I found like a, some pretty big ones, and that helped our defense a lot because we were able to rotate based on things they were doing or things that they didn't do. Um, so that helped our defense a lot. Also, the first time we played them, we lost, I think, four out of six pistols, and we lost every clutch. So yeah. going into that game, we all knew like if we just won at least a few pistols and actually played the clutch as well, uh, that we could close out the game and actually win. Uh, we knew the disadvantage with the upper bracket uh, that they had of banning two maps that were. They get both bans, right? You get zero bans. Yeah, Chet. yeah. They banned a uh, fracture and split, and we got none. And fracture mm. and split are like two very good maps for us, and two yeah. not good maps for them. So we knew everything was like against us in that final, and we just had to mm. do better on ascent. We knew if we could win like ascent or breeze, that we could take the whole game, because then there would just be like so much pressure for them. And the fact that we won ascent. That helped us a lot going into the next maps like bind 
we scrimmed them actually on bind before the this um whole VCT even started. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they had a completely different comp, so <laughs> we prepared for two different comps: the one that they played in their region and in the scrim, and then they just went out something different. But we were familiar playing that one, so we had a general idea of how to trade util specifically in showers against them, uh, and like how to capitalize on that on our defense. Uh, and obviously Victor had some aces, so that was sick as well. That helped us. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, also that, uh, I think it was Aspas. He was raised on that map and I knew he'd be showers mm -hmm. a lot, but uh, we didn't know he would dominate us that hard playing showers. I even talked to him mm -hmm. after the match and he said he was like, in Brazil, they call him like the king of showers. And <laughs> yeah. it was yeah. pretty, it was pretty crazy. Like his he, plays he are clean. That. Clean is, yeah. clean is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh clean. man. We even, I even Mitch called it, our casters. Yeah, I even called attack pause to like counter him so we were gonna go like four short a and then have like lurker shower and then we we're gonna try to wrap him but we didn't do the wrapping part but we at least flashed him but he was aware of it so props to him at least you know he <laughs> he locked that a side down uh um, and then for breeze uh yeah that one we after the bo5 or zeta uh we went to dry run for two hours for t side and discuss our mid default and some stuff we took inspiration from Gambit or M3C or whatever, whatever they're called yeah. right now. So we took some inspiration from them and then incorporated KO instead of Sky that they had. And CD side, I just did it on the day before the match. I just full like anti to whatever I could and then <laughs> just told them to run like a specific setup every round. Uh, I, and it I kind mean, of paid off. Kind of. What the fuck? I mean, you have to, <laughs> you have to win. Like, you have to win on some really like less than ideal maps, right? I think your yeah. record coming into this game on Ascent is like one in three yep. for this tournament, right? Yeah. They were all and, close games, though. Breeze, which, is your, yeah. which is what? Your fucking insta ban, your, your permaban map. Yeah. Like, this is actually, this is quite astonishing stuff, Jet. Um, I want to, can we, can we dial it back a little bit, though, if we can? Because yeah, I, yeah, I want to yeah. like maybe uh, pick your brain. I, I don't want specific strats from you, but I'd definitely love to get like your impressions about sort of how you felt at, at points throughout the match. Um, we're, we're looking at Breeze here. I want to go back to Ascent though and talk about how you guys began that map because, I mean, you had all the momentum early on on Ascent. Like, what's what's the discussion like on that defense side? Like, getting 10 rounds on Ascent defense is fucking, you know, it's pretty insane, especially against a team like Loud. What's, how do you put this together? Uh, well, before the match started, uh, I think our biggest issue the last time we played them was we let them pretty much execute whatever they wanted without interrupting them. And Victor specifically did like a good job for us when I told him like make sure we interrupt their default by like pushing a main, pushing cat, uh, like underhand flashing. We coordinated all those with our team, and even nice. though he didn't get like all the kills, uh, he always had Marv there to trade him. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that helped us a lot. Like whenever they a split, we were a main, we flashed, we killed the split. Like once you killed the split, like so much easier. So that made our defense way better. So Victor, like even though he didn't get all the kills, he full carried like that secret half and like. That's so important. Yeah. People are not going to see that, especially if they only look at the scoreboard, but even if they're not watching the game closely. This is yeah. like a great example like of guys just not like topping the scoreboard, but is like really pivotal in a, in a matchup like this. Yeah, exactly. Like without him calling all the like these weird underhand plays that we never ever do, we're generally really passive. But in the, <laughs> in the final, I was just like, let's just scrim them as well. Like, let's not like play like so scared. Because yeah. when I was in CS, I actually had a, we played Navi in a final first when I first joined Energy. And we played pretty scared. And then from then on out, every final I played after in CS, we just played like more aggressive and it usually paid off because people expect you to play perfect in finals. They don't expect mm -hmm. you to like, you know, just run around and like just, just scrim a spot. So that like gave us a huge advantage on Ascent. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about the T side at all. That is where it got like kind of dicey for us, I would say. Yeah. No, tell tell me why you got dicey at that part because it's ex exactly that. Like you guys looked really good on on ascent defense. Those underhand throws that we were talking about before, I, I was actually in this matchup instead, and not the the first time you guys faced off against each other. Because I talked about it before, Chet, where you know Victor was throwing that that underhand flash in the omen smoke on catwalk, and then you guys double swung in that, and then got a recon in the back to to get the kills through through smoke. That was pretty dope, but. Definitely, what what happened on the attacker side here? What did they did they get a better read on you guys, or what what was going on there? Um, I mean, they played pretty similar. I think our adjustments to their plan, like we tried something different, like try not going as mid as much as we mm -hmm. did in the last game, 
and mm -hmm. it wasn't really working out because the KO that they had was like stopping us with his molly and their omen was like playing around the smokes really well on sight. Yeah. Yeah, so it was making it hard for us. I think we missed like some crucial trades in the and some clutches in that T side as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would have closed out a little bit faster. I think when once teams win pistol, no matter how like down you are, it's like such a momentum swing. And oh, yeah. I think oh, they yeah. won I, I'm not sure if correct me if I'm wrong, I think they won bonus as well. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so once they went bonus, like they had everything going their way at that point. They won the first six rounds of that half. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> that, that made it very tough. And like pretty much at that point we're playing a gun round every every single round. Like we can't break their money. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we're just playing against like a really good gun round and they have very good structure too. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's not where even if I ante as hard as I could, it's still very, very hard. So to, to... Yeah, I was yeah, gonna yeah. say the adjustments that we were making was just trying to hit their sights more and just trying to just like bombard them before they mm -hmm. can like do anything to us. It eventually pulls out, so yeah. that that that's what's good. And you talk about this momentum, right? Winning pistol, getting all the momentum of that. I even want to take even a, a step further back of looking at the veto process. So do you feel that you lose a bit of that momentum when you don't have that much uh in terms of like uh um of say into the veto process like what what's your take on that how do you feel about the uh the map advantages and the map bans that they're able to get uh coming from the winner's bracket mm, i think we're comfortable with the maps like actually going to this event we thought ascend was one of our best maps and i think we even picked mm -hmm. it versus a team earlier in the, the tournament mm -hmm. so yeah. you know maybe it wasn't the best for us i i felt like we we're still good on ascent we just lost a bunch of closed games if you look at the scores yeah, you did uh so I think we we're comfortable on a stand, comfortable on bind going into that veto. We knew like what the veto was exactly before we even played the series. Because we knew they just had a band fracture and split. It's just bad maps for them. Uh and then Breeze was the only one that was like kinda scary. But I don't think like the veto had anything to do with like why we lost those rounds and like the comebacks were happening. Uh, I think it was just all like them getting the momentum off pistols and they just generally play well. Like they're just a good team. Mm-hmm. I, I had something that I wanted to ask you, and I've heard people talk about it. So, um, you guys were playing from the group stages all the way to the grand finals, and it seems like that was helping you guys a lot to adapt, and even from that first match all the way till the end, the adaptation, and the role that you took in it was insane. Do you, do you think that is something that also played against uh, some teams that only play on those playoffs? Like, it's really like loud. We didn't have a lot of information on them. And even, you know, Paper X and all those teams, G2 especially, it seems like only playing those playoffs were actually going against them over starting from the group stages. Do you think that's a factor to take into account? Uh, Yeah, I think we, every time we lose, like when we lost versus Xerzia the first time, we actually learned like a lot, like mistakes that we make. And they just do... These teams do things that any teams just don't do that we're not comfortable with and just catch us off guard. So we learned like a lot and it also the things that we they did to us, we incorporated in our game. Yeah. And I feel like when you start in the playoffs, you're not facing any of these teams right away and you're just playing like how you normally play. And it I think that's a disadvantage for them, even though they just gotta skip everything and shit and hide stuff. Because mm -hmm. maybe the stuff they're hiding isn't even like fully fleshed out or even works against other people. Whereas we got to test everything. We showed literally everything. I think we have like a few things like we didn't do. And we just got to refine like almost everything. And like even when we lost first loud the first time, uh, after that, we just refined everything that we did. Even they gave us a strat that we took and did it versus them. <laughs> like we just, we just like learned so much every time we lost that I feel like it just made us better. And then it's stuff that we're going to incorporate in our game going forward. And maybe even other awesome. NA teams will take. And make just make our region just better. All right, so I've I've got one for you here, and I'm I'm sure it's no secret that with your your history in Valorant leading up to this, people were uh we'll say less than enthused with your impact as a coach. Uh, obviously <laughs> in this situation now you've got a huge accolade to set up, and the phrase I love to use is like lightning doesn't strike twice in the same place. And now where you're a multi-game champion, sort of from a coach to a coach, I know that it's really hard for the general public to sort of see your impact. So I'd love to sort of hear just from like your firsthand perspective, like where you think your value add is the greatest to this team. Cause I know you've mentioned already that like you anti strated a ton going into the first match. I'd love to know more about just the, the dynamic that you add to the team and sort of the interplay between you and FNS and how it's yeah, sort just of... attack onto that. Cause the boys gassed you up big time. Exactly. Yeah. The players love you, but like, what does that mean in practical terms without giving away any secrets? 
I mean, I can give like a general, like what I try to do on a day to day. So before prac and even after prac, uh, I'll try to like, uh, first of all, I make all the comps right now. Uh, like I took full control over that. Maybe like people give some input here and there, but it's mainly on me. Same with like strats and all that. Like FNS will give input as well, but it's mainly kind of on me right now. And uh, I also try to like get all the lineups if possible. I try to make sure people know how to play their agents. There's like, they know all the interactions. I just try to make their life as easy as possible so they can just focus on aiming instead of worrying about like, yo, I found this cool shock. Like, can we do this? Like, <laughs> I'll find it for them. And then I'll do like all the work that they don't need to like worry about. So that way they just shoot well. That's all I want them to do. And then same thing with strategy. <laughs> I don't want them like, whenever they like, whenever they tell me something, I'm like, I don't want your opinion. Like, just, <laughs> just focus on killing. <laughs> do like, what I fucking yeah. do with you, bitch. <laughs> I, 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 actually, I actually hate when people give me their opinion in this team, and I'm just like, just trust. Me. I'm like, just trust me. Like, just trust. I love yeah. it. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. that. Every, so much. And everyone, everyone always trusts me too. So, the more we started winning, the more trust I kept getting, and I think it paid off. Like everyone just believed in the system that we were providing that me and uh, FNS was like uh, creating, mm -hmm. uh, and that like helped a lot in terms. Like that's what I would do as a coach, and then also during the matches, obviously. I'm anteing, and then I'm like, me and Vanessa are creating a game plan for like the first few rounds on like how we want to approach things. Uh, so generally, I'm just trying to make the best system possible, so that way players have less to do during the week mm -hmm. besides just playing ranked and DMing and stuff. I just yeah. I just want to make it so they don't do anything, basically. I love it, because because this brings me back to like, uh, you know, Mitch, you you talked about Chet's dresser and stuff like that too. Like the last time that we had Chet on this show was yeah. when he was just joining TSM, and we're like, hey, what are you gonna be working on with TSM? And it's like, oh, trying to improve his surrounds and communication. But I like how with Optic, it's just like, hey, I'm gonna focus on making sure that these guys can just frag because they already had the fundamentals there. So there's a difference already of like that focus that you had to bring into this lineup for, for optic when you join this roster versus what you had to do for TSM. But you talked about the coaching staff or, or just in general, what you had to do. And I want to, I wanted to add on to the fact because I saw the tweet earlier on too, of even Jovi uh, from X hundred thieves was able to hop on and assist you and FNS to be able to uh, work on some things. And, you know, I, I feel that Jovi, uh, has had like a like a tough route within Hunter Thieves. I think after Frost left and then Jovi tried to hold the reins, I, I, it was already like a, a roster that was falling apart. So what can you tell us about Jovi uh, in, in general as as your, I guess, analyst at this point? Yeah, uh, he was uh, on a trial contract for us right now. Uh, so we'll see what happens after. We haven't discussed it at all. Uh, but he was just uh, mainly interacting with me. He didn't really interact with the team at all. I just mm -hmm. wanted everyone to just focus on themselves. I don't, like I said, I don't take opinions much. I just, <laughs> just do whatever I want to do. And I just I use it. Jovi mainly for like helping me find timings on things. So, like I'll give an idea and then I just say like, yo, just, just run for me, bro. Just like tell me like if this works. <laughs> and then also, uh, since I anti strat a lot, I use his notes to like double check me in case mm -hmm. like I mess up. So that's one thing I wanted uh, him to do is just, I wanted him to do his own work. And then I would compare with my stuff just to confirm if my stuff was good or not. Uh, nice. That was like the main thing I needed him for because I feel like I might or I might have like a huge oversight, and if he was able to correct me, then that's good. And if we're on the same page, then that means just my stuff was fine already. So it's like another layer, the, the yeah, good exactly. old sanity yeah. check, as I like yeah, to call it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, that was a, that's what his main role was. He was just like help, like helping me find stuff that that I couldn't do otherwise if I needed a player, and then mm -hmm. just also just double checking me making sure my stuff was good instead of like me just solely relying on myself because i felt a little overwhelmed doing everything at some point and i just needed like just a little bit of help to just get yeah. over it <laughs> but he's Sorry. been good he's been a, he's been a good kid i, I respect awesome. that he uh put all the effort in uh for this uh bct awesome awesome let's uh let's talk bind for a sec because mm -hmm. <clears throat> this is I mean, I don't know if you know this, but obviously over the course of um, Reykjavik, this was your best map in terms of your defense halves. Uh, yep. You guys like really, really uh, good round win percentage on defense. You played it plenty as well, so it's not like a sample size problem. Uh, can't win pistols on the, uh, on this day, of course. Uh, you know, in this map, obviously, <laughs> you're at least able to break them in round two and, and actually put together a really good defensive half. I want to talk about fine. Let, let's start by talking about that, that, that CT side because you guys... Look pretty comfortable there, even against that sort of raw aggression. And you talked about how you're trying to play around 
showers as well quite a lot in this map and how maybe Aspas gave you some problems here. But let's start with this first half and how you get set up. Uh, so defense-wise, we just had like a setup that we wanted to try. I think we did something similar with Zeta, uh, like a similar setup. So we just wanted to run it again and see if Loud adapted. So we were playing like 3A mainly against yep. this team. And we knew like that they like to play pretty slow and they wouldn't really go off the first wave of utility. So we just kind of like stuck with playing 3A. And I think they did end up going up A a lot in that match. So we were always like stacked there. And I think eventually we started bringing our sky towards like U-Haul area just to get mm -hmm. info. Because sometimes they would like drone fake us or like Roomba fake us. Yeah. That way we were able to get info almost always. And we I almost... mean, just like dog out of U-Haul. Uh, yeah, yeah. And... yeah, yeah. he would dog or like layer his flash. Like after 40 seconds, he'd do the next one. Or maybe he double mm -hmm. does it within the 40. Uh. So we just like trying to get as much info as possible, short A versus them, just to see what kind of strat they're running. Uh, and I think that helped our defense a lot. And obviously, the when the second round broke their momentum, uh, they like broke their money as well. And we got like good ults off of that. So that also helped a lot, uh, just defense wise. Yeah. Um. Obviously, you already sort of told us about some of your woes. Uh. You know, trying to play through showers. You guys look like you emphasize showers at times there as well. Like we saw Viper's Pit there used by FNS to just try and control that. And, you know, not only does he throw it down, he goes and takes the fight and is able to win there. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I was obviously felt yeah, like yeah. you guys emphasize that to some degree as well yeah. with the sort of info gathering on, on short A. Let's talk about the, uh, the, uh, your attacking side though. Again, um, you're not able to control that part of the map in remotely the same way. But what is it, what is it that Aspis is, is sort of doing is it just he reading you particularly well? It seems like a few of your like little pieces get seen through by him. Well, he has it's a him and Saucy that like are yeah. showers together, or like Saucy's like triple, like helping him. Uh, and it was hard to like contest all the time because he would just Roomba or Nade, and then he would shock, and we couldn't get shower. So then we started going short A, but then he would live shower, and we weren't doing a good job of like wrapping him shower. Like if you see on the screen right now, we should have like wrapped him. Like at least, or like in another yeah. round, where you guys like push through towards vents there. Yeah, maybe. yeah, yeah. And like Marv, one round was like lurking shower, the one I called a timeout on, and we yeah. didn't wrap him again. I think we were playing a little too like uh, passive to kill him. Like we should have just swung and kill him, and that would have been the end of it. I did mm -hmm. in one of the timeouts. I called a tack for one of the rounds for the current round that was happening, and then I called another strat in case that one didn't work that we didn't get to show yet. So I had a couple of counters to stop him, but I think we just had some heroics that put us over the line for that T side. Yeah. So, uh. Yeah. That 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 kid just owns showers. Like I think we just had to go to the drawing board and just make a better exec that comes up from short against him for next time. <laughs> Run me through that uh, on your attacker side too, because uh, I think there were there were definitely some. You know, hero plays that had to come through. Yeah, let's show Marv was... getting that fucking nasty 4K, like round 19, yeah. I think it was. There, there was Marv with the nasty 4K in, in round 19, but even the round before, where, where you guys had to TP and then try to stem you pack into a Viper's Pit, back into an ult into you all with a showstopper into you. Like, yeah, what was what was going on in that call there, too? Um... Like, it, the, it was like high pressure match, and generally, like, people wouldn't leave it up to chance. So, more often than not, people over rotate in this mm -hmm. kind of match. So if we make a lot of pressure somewhere and we commit an ult, that they would over rotate. And I think they did, right? Like, I don't think anyone yep. was B. Yes. So I think everyone recognized that. And then we TP'd and I think we ran back short, right? Yep. So it was like a double fake. And like I said, cause just because it was a final and there was so much pressure, they almost had to respect that. And I think FNS just made a really good <laughs> mid round call. Just to like abuse that we know that their rotations are fast, and that honestly was like just an insane like call by him. Like I don't think many <laughs> people would just call that. And I think Marv added like a uh yeah I just saw it. he just ulted the stimmy and the orbital strike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that just like guaranteed the clear for us so we can get the bomb down. So that was like definitely on the fly as well. Like him it's just dirty. adding that. You left someone yeah. in showers there as well while you hit that. Yeah, TP yeah, and yeah. I think around. it was I think it was our sky. I think he was in there just to yeah. like get any lurk kills potentially. Uh, if they like went through the TP to follow us, mm -hmm. so everything was like set up pretty decently, and that just shows that our like chemistry is good right now, and we just hopefully do not lose that going to the next uh, next stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys to force overtime had to put in the fucking work. I mean, Victor had to have uh, 
a pretty insane round here. <laughs> Raise on him. The raise is yep. nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I gotta say, I, round, Chet, yeah. I I don't know if you know, but like, uh, I think I saw like a, a a message come out on Reddit or something like that too. But like, with you guys winning uh, this Masters event. There's only like one scenario where you guys don't qualify for champions. Is it? It's if there's going to be another NA versus NA uh, in the, like the oh, Masters, Masters two finals. finals. Yeah, that that you guys are not part of. Did you uh, did you know, know that? So we're basically locked in. Is what you're saying, right? That's what I've heard. Yeah, <laughs> apparently to what uh, you're saying. So. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's cool. Like, I'm down to wherever that is. I have no idea. So down for that. More <laughs> <hands>. <laughs> I mean, so, the fuck is nice just got home for Christ's yeah. sake, man. I mean, we, we Jet lag has it much... off, so yeah. you ready for the, that's uh, true. Champions? That's true. Like... <laughs> Honestly, we don't even have that much time to like reset for this next VCT. Like once the I think that Vade comes out tomorrow, right or whatever. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. once that comes out, I just have to like figure out what we need to do for next week because we release our prac next week again. Yeah, and then we're back. Do you guys in have to? But you guys have to go. You guys don't have to go through the gauntlet, right? You guys are already invited to like the. Oh uh, yeah, the, we're at the main event, at, which I think. They won mm -hmm. masters uh, I, for yeah. fuck's sake. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think that's knows, on the thirteenth or something. I'm not sure. Yeah. Like middle of May. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the open is like I think the open's on Thursday, and I'm gonna just see who, how many teams copied our strats on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. They. We also have somebody in chat. Uh, Kirby is asking uh, about your uh, your pick on neon right and i think I, I like i like for you to elaborate that on that a little bit more than like neon's good on like running away from timing with her kit because i think that's that's, that's probably that's like the most standard one that that a lot of people well, she beats will talk defensive about timings as well right yeah yeah, okay. yeah. So, so how, how does, does that, that that work into the play style of optic gaming overall though are you saying why are we running it uh yeah well yep. i wanted to try something uh different because i felt like we sucked at champions so i just wanted to <laughs> Be like completely <laughs> like different than any any other team, and okay. uh, I first asked uh, a guy from Alliance. His name was Lucker, uh, mm. and he was playing Neon in their region, and he stopped playing it. And I was wondering why he wasn't playing it, uh, and he just said it was kind of difficult, and you had to play around it the the whole team and stuff. So he didn't recommend it, but at least like he gave me an idea of like why he wasn't doing it. So we ended up playing it. I just like one day I was like, guys, we should just at least try us on Haven first, and then see how it goes for the next maps. So we tried on Haven first. Uh, it ended up being pretty good for us because our CD sides generally are terrible on Haven. Uh, mm -hmm. And then with Jet, with uh, Chamber and Neon, we were just fast rotating everywhere with the TPs and the speed. Uh, so mm -hmm. we we're over stacking bomb sites like crazy, and like teams didn't know what to do. And also we had, I think we had Breach at the time. So with Breach and Neon, we were just stunning everything and just running at them. It was pretty hard to stop. Uh, and then I just like that play style. I like Victor running in. Like, he's a rifle entry. Uh, I want him to, like, always get the space for us, and he's pretty selfless in that. Like, he'll play Neon. He might Neon, in my opinion, is not a high-fragging duelist. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. You, when you play Neon, you're pretty much saying, I'm going to die for the team, but he'll you'll get traded. So yeah. that's the type of player he is. And it, without him being selfless, like, most players, I think, in his situation wouldn't do it. But the fact that he was down to do it after a few days of practice uh, was nice because literally all we do is just trade him. He just runs in a side haven. We just we just trade him. Like if he if he lives though and gets the entry, then it's sick because then yeah. yeah then the other team and just he looks and absolutely looks fucking sweet. amazing when he does yeah. that. And then we just tried on like every other map. We tried on fracture. I think we didn't try it on bind because his raise was just insane. We didn't want to change it, but yeah. maybe we'll look into that. Um, and then fracture we we're also horrible on. Uh, in practice, so we were like, let's just change everything and try Neon. You play one of your best maps in Iceland, like straight uh, up. Yeah, yeah, in Iceland it's been good, but when we were in NA, we were getting owned. And then when we were packing before <laughs> Iceland started, we were getting owned, and we were just like, yeah. we, were just, we were like, we were like, we can't play meta on this map. Like our meta play is just bad. So we just have to make our own meta, and we just continued with the Neon, and then we did Neon on Split, uh, and that we got inspiration from Gambit on that one, uh, mm. but we changed it and put our own like. Uh, like what's on it right. yeah yep. and that ended up working out uh well as well because whenever we play neon and we victor is a and specifically at ramp whenever teams do like a ramp strat he just has a stun ready always and it just destroys the split and that mm -hmm. we're just like this stun is just too strong so yeah. that it just gave us like so much like potential to do like all these crazy execs and like stoppings power on 
their execs that we just want to abuse that character more and more on all these maps. But going forward, I have no idea what we're going to do. I don't know if we're going to keep doing this. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, this is a specific situation. Uh, your your defense side on Haven, right, which you said was kind of weak, and we often see Victor try and play towards like A long uh, on the Neon in the early round. Get, got a little bit countered by Zeta because they just threw all their util at A long. What's Victor trying to do there? Like if, you know, is, is he trying to just like put, like put the clock on a slow default by, you know, being able to lurk like really early? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we have like, like six or seven different setups when he's there. So if he's alone, then yeah, he's just trying to like stop them from going fast and we try to rotate to him potentially. It kind of just depends on the team we play. Like if I know the other team is like doing a bunch of fast strats, like on A, then I'll go over rotate. But then if we're playing like a slow default team, we'll kind of trust him, like hold it alone. So it just depends on the team. Like I'll just give him a game plan for that game, and then we'll just try to see like if they're playing Project. the same or not. Yeah. Yeah. We just kind of trust him in the beginning, and then we'll ad adapt later. Mm -hmm. That's it. But the the so, stun A the stun A lobby is good, by the way. Like it does stop people a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so speaking about adapting all that too is is now talking about that that third map on Breeze because when I was watching you guys play that uh, you know I the, the fight yeah <laughs> the finals had against the guard for the NAVCTs when I saw Marv pull out a Sky I think and then Victor playing Chamber I was like there's gotta be something that you guys are be are, are working on where you're not playing like a you're not trying to play like a current meta or anything, and you, there's some things that you need to fix. So, what what were the weaknesses that you're seeing uh, in terms of your playstyle on Breeze, and and why that composition against Loud uh, on that third map this series? Uh, well, our weaknesses on Breeze is just we have no chemistry on it at all. <laughs> we're, we're just <laughs> we just have no clue what we're doing. Uh, nice. Like we want all we do right now, like before, we just watch vods and try to see what other teams are doing. We yeah. just are lost. We're like, like that's why I was like perma banning it because I was just yeah. had no, I had no faith in my team figuring this map out in the time that we had. So, what do you mean? That's what uh, Nefinus said. That's what happens when Daddy calls, isn't it? On that map? Uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> but that, that's when we put some time into it. So before that, I had no faith. So I just, nice. I was just like, I was just guys were just banning it. But then for that loud match, uh, yeah, we changed to Victor to KO because he's just naturally better on KO than Chamber. Yeah, and yeah. then, uh. Jimmy was just having a fire tournament, so we were just like, okay, just play chamber. I'm on the chamber, and he, yeah. And he and he loves playing different characters too, so I think he just had more fun playing chamber than just playing awesome. like controllers all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then he actually got like a few key entries, which was nice, uh, on the T side for us. Uh, but preparation wise, like I said, after the Zeta game, we dry on for two hours, uh, just strats, and then literally CD side, I just made a bunch of random setups for us to do to like get over the the hump. I mean that's egregious. You you go up against the you know the second best team you know in the in the world, not counting MEA for right now, and you can dry run for a couple hours and fucking pull this out. Like that is there's a there's you know I know you're you're thinking of it in a very strategic way, but there's a bit of magic here. You've got to agree. Like the fact that your boys there, can turn up. There was a lot of like uh pressure I think on Loud because they're down two maps. I think that definitely uh, like hurt them. So it's it's hard to handle. Like even if we are in that situation, it'll be hard to handle too. They're just down. It's it's. I think it's also like statistically not in their favor. They win that Bo five. They're down two maps, mm -hmm. so there's just so much pressure on them, and they're so young compared to our team, which is like I think was the oldest team in the event. Yeah. So they just just a lot of things weren't there in their favor after they lost ascent. I think uh, it was just a lot of pressure, but I think if they continue, and I even talked to them after the event, they're they're insane. I think they'll be good uh, the next one. Yeah. Yeah. So I was thinking too, like a like a little SK might be our era from CS:GO after like it's coming already. I find for mm -hmm. for the Brazil region with this loud yeah. super team, their, their strats are very good. Go yeah, even uh, even in CS, right? Brazil took just a little bit to start off and to pop yep. off, and I feel like that's what we're seeing right now in Valorant. In Rainbow Six, now they're like the yeah, most yeah. dominant region in Rainbow Six. So yeah. it's a uh, it's it's a region that's really good for for tactical FPS. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, you came into Iceland, I would say after a period where NA was in like its biggest period of flux ever, right? Like a lot of the, like the top teams of yesteryear are struggling, right? Like hundred yeah. teams is reforming. I mean, we're all terrible. Dog shit, you know? Yeah, I mean, fucking, uh, you know, even, 
you know, the guard, you know, we're talking this whole fucking, everyone's joking about Mickey Mao and everyone playing his tier two stuff and these sort of teams popping up. You feel like, obviously, you feel like the, the region was pretty weak. How do you sort of, how, how do you feel about the region now? Has that changed? Because you might, amazing. you guys we might fucking have won. won, bro. Yeah, you guys might have won. <laughs> That's fair. But you had to, you had to fucking, I feel like you had to reinvent yourselves to some degree, literally just like on the fly, learning how to play Breeze. So how do you sort of feel the region looks globally now? Has your opinion changed? What needs to change in NA if so? I mean, uh, I don't. I think like our region is good, but there's like obviously like a clear difference between like some of the top teams and the weaker ones. Like mm -hmm. I think C9 is the team that definitely should have qualified, and they're very good. Like they have very good pieces on their team, and their strats are actually good. But I think uh, maybe the pressure got to them not qualifying this time. Not mm -hmm. sure, but I definitely think they're a strong team. They'll always be a strong team. Uh, V1 I think is also another strong team. Uh, like they have good fundamentals. Uh, they play like very similar to like other EU teams uh, that we've scrimmed, uh, and then I think uh, maybe not Hundred Thieves so much in the past uh, sure. or Energy. I think yeah, I probably leave those uh, three teams and Guard included actually. So C9, mm -hmm. us, Guard, and V1. I think I... were the strongest teams in NA. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not so sure how it is now. We haven't scrimmed at all. Yeah. But I don't know. Our region is decent. I think there's a lot of work that players have to do and be more flexible. Maybe after this event that they saw all of our players like being flexible, they will do the same. That's the thing, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think just people are too comfortable playing meta in our region, and there's not enough like teams that are willing to experiment. Whereas in the EU, like even Liquid, uh, they're famous for like doing weird comps. Uh, like we yeah. need more of that in our region. Just people just willing to try shit and not like be scared to lose. I it was that a lot too, right? When you're looking at last year, is like, okay, well, we need a jet opera. We need a good cipher. We need a good this X, Y, Z. But now it's just like, we need good players that could flex into different agents so that they could actually have a, an amalgamation of different comps that you, that you could run uh, on, uh, on certain maps. I think another problem is people always try to copy stuff instead of making their own shit. And like, you can take a comp uh, but maybe it doesn't fit your team's players. Like, yeah. we can't take, like, certain comps and, like, it doesn't work because, like, maybe Victor is just, like, on a weird character or, like, maybe Marv is not playing the controller he should be playing. Like, we kind of make comps that fit more to just how we have as strengths instead of, like, straight up copying. If, there, if there's something to copy, like, it might be a strat and we'll try to fit into our comp. We won't, like, conform to their comp and do it exactly how the other team did it because it just mm -hmm. doesn't work for us. I think yeah, teams and, just copy a lot. That, that's sure. one of the cool things about Optic, right? Because you see something like the composition that you guys run in Fracture, and it seems hard to imagine another team running it and having the same amount of success just because it's so unique to to you guys. And like you said, it's it's a way that works for all the players. Uh, and even if other tries to copy it, it doesn't seem like it. So that is why uh the the changes that we've saw from from the again from the group stages all the way till the end where the biggest difference for optic right because you you guys were always uh, willing to change things around willing to go a little bit off meta and bring a, a new strategy that we never saw before and it's you know having so many competitive teams in nay it just brings like the, the question of can they also do the same can the coaches that they have as well the ideals be able to make those callouts too. That that is the kind of the only concern that I have for for NA and for other teams is how, what is the capability of experimenting with something new and wanting to risk something like that. I mean, I hope they don't fall into the trap of like just copying everything that we did because we have like so many weird protocols and stuff that they probably wouldn't have or we didn't even show. So I think if any any teams like they should just play their game and like just make things that make sense for their players because we just it's just it's hard to replicate you can't just like straight up steal it from us i think certain maps maybe but like like fracture like i feel like it's hard to like do exactly what we did yeah like so it's yeah. so intrinsic to your team and sometimes the flaws of your team are what allows you to or you know requires you to create these setups that actually end up highlighting your strengths more which is what i kind of love yeah you know, you're obviously, obviously jet lagged as fuck, man. Uh, you know, it's great to have you here. I wanna, yeah. What I want to ask you is, are you the best team in the world right now? This is the yes, last yes. thing I, I want to ask you. Uh, I have no idea. I think Gambit's pretty <laughs> insane. I think FPX is pretty insane. 
Yeah. I think I think uh, if either of those teams qualify in the next one, they'll give us a run for our money, just because okay. they're that that good. So I'm not gonna Agreed. say we're the best, but in scrims at least, those guys own us. So if they replicate that in matches, which I think they can, then maybe they're the best. I have no idea. What the, you, you got to scrim to me and me a teams right while you were there? Who, yeah. This is a question from chat here from uh, from Kari, but who 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 do you feel like was like the most impressive EMEA roster? Uh, Gambit. They were the best. The, by right. far, <laughs> by, by yeah. far, yeah. Chronicle is insane. That guy is actually yeah, insane. Yeah. Redgar yeah. as well. This guy is running at us like with KO and just shitting on us. Like this guy's insane. The legend yeah. of scrim yeah. bit they, continues. They just, when, when we enter, when we enter the server, like I stream our practices to like just to record it for later. Yeah. And when we enter the server, I label it like we're getting owned today. For <laughs> <one>. <laughs> like they, they're they're just that good. Like, I, I go in the day knowing we lost the scrim. Oh man! Okay. <laughs> I love I it. I, I even tell that to my teammates. I'm like, guys, we, we just, let's, let's aim for seven rounds. Six Why rounds. are we giving Mitch Man fucking ammunition? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. I, I mean, he was good. Listen, bro. he was good. Uh, I'm yeah. hoping that we're getting more confidence at least uh, with the next time that you guys could potentially face M3C versus when you guys faced against M3C at Berlin, uh, right? Uh, yeah. Hopefully it's not going to be an O3, and then we'll see at least something that's going to be closer. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, they just have so many like good strats that if you don't know first time or, like off bat, like, it'll catch you off guard. Like The strats they did to us in the scrims, that's like stuff I've never seen before. And like I'm stealing that shit. So yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in fairness, was your split comp? Uh, w was that sort of inspired by them at all? Yeah, yeah, it was. We we like saw that they ran it because they had neon, and we we're like, let's just run neon as well if they are. And yeah, it, it paid off. Like, we didn't steal exactly everything they did. We just took like a couple setups maybe, and then we just decided like add like our own stuff. Yeah, uh, it was, we were it was watching sick. against Fnatic, and they they yeah. entered the they entered the neon up mid, and like they double stunned like into yeah. into ropes like every round. Yeah, yeah. they should have won that game, uh, but obviously, <laughs> like anyone can say that if it goes to NOT, like yeah. one round just could change everything. But yeah, that their neon was very good. Like Defo played it like very well, and he was like he did this one thing where he neon walls B, and he just runs around in a circle. I don't know if you guys noticed that. Yeah. That just messes with like the guy who's anchoring like so much. He doesn't know what the guy's the actually running in. Audio, yeah, yeah. Pretty, that was like pretty smart by them. That's like something we incorporated. We just like I was gonna say that's in. what something Victor yeah. did. He put a wall up yeah. and he just started running circles too. Yeah, <laughs> we, just, like, we start running around in a circle and people just have no clue. I'm sure if you do that in like any rank game, people just start throwing everything like all their util. So, <laughs> that's incredible. Uh, Jetman, thanks for your time. Uh, it's it's great to have you on the man. show and thank obviously you. congrats, bro. Like you know, thank you, thank you. You have you, been a champion, you know, before, but now it's nice to see you get some respect in Valorant, man. Hopefully, uh, yeah. Let's uh, say it was a much needed win, <laughs> just, <laughs> just just to get people off my back. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thanks for joining us, I man. Hope you have a have a great one. Also, uh, yeah, obviously, Dan, great to have you on the show as well. I mean, pleasure yep, to have thank, both of you. Yep, thank you for having me. Thanks, yeah. chat. Uh, Thanks, Dan. Yeah. We're, we're going to go to a yes. break, but uh, we're going to get you guys ready for our next segment here. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about Fade, and this is that sort of developer interview. we got six minutes of Fade goodness. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. We'll be back to talk more about Fade after the break. Well, the party never <laughs> stops. By the power of teleportation, I have whisked Brennan Barler away from the desk, and we're joined by some fantastic guests. I mean, the people that know the most about something like this, we've got ourselves John and Nick from the development team over there in L.A., How's, how's it going? Could you hear us over there? It's so far away. <laughs> we can totally hear you from all the way over here. The power of technology is absolutely amazing. There you go. Can you give us a quick rundown, just a brief overview of the agent and the kit just to kick us off? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can take that, yeah. Um, Fade is an initiator um, and she will be bringing similar outputs to Sova in terms of recon with a little bit of a, her own unique twist. Uh, and we hope that uh, you can't hide from her. I, I've seen we've seen that a lot of her kit revolves around the trails. Uh, so I want to get your perspective and, and learn a little bit about how that works uh, because it seems complex to me. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the trails um, they work uh, basically like uh, the the opponents will leave trails once they get affected by certain abilities from Fade, specifically her signature and her ultimate, uh, and then. Wherever they leave, they'll leave this trail in which both Fade and her allies can see. Uh, and that will usually give you information on a longer tail information that lasts around 12 seconds to be able to make a, a call or a play on where an opponent is, even if you don't have, you know, Sova's level of wall hacks. Um, 
in many examples, if somebody could leave a location and they could go left or right, you can know exactly where they went. I think that's information that's going to be power powerful. Uh, one element of the uh, of the kit that I was wondering about as well, because a lot of agents they have some form of counterplay with the kit being breakable. How much of Fade's kit can you can you destroy on the opposing side of it? Yeah, there are two components of Fade's kit that you can destroy. Um, her creature, you can destroy before it gets to you, and then uh, her haunt, which is her signature. It's much like a reveal dart from Sova. Uh, a bit different in how it's placed, but it is also destructible before it can ever reveal you. But the other components of her kit are not destructible. So you've got you've got this prowler that's going out. It's a big cat. You've got the recon that you've talked about as well. Then there's the tether and the ultimate. Can you walk me through those final two as well? Yeah, so the tether, or what we're calling it, seize. Uh, it's a grenade-like ability uh, that will, uh, when it explodes and hits the floor, it'll create a zone, and if the enemies are caught in the zone, uh, a shadowy hand will grab their leg and, and restrict their movement for a brief amount of time. And uh, it'll also deafen them, as I talked about before, so we're hoping it's a really scary feeling of being effectively trapped and you can't hear anything, uh, so you don't know when they're going to swing or if a raised nade is coming, etc. Like You just don't know exactly where to go. Um, so that's how that's the seize. And then the ultimate, Nightfall. Um, very similar uh, to the Reach's ultimate in the sense that it creates a gigantic rolling wave forward. Um, but the difference is there is that um, it'll trail enemies that overlaps or hits uh, and also deafen them. Um, and decay them, so you'll take 75 HP damage immediately, but the HP will start going back up um, right, uh, right as it happens, so uh, it's kind of like surviving a nightmare if you can live through the whole thing. Um, but <laughs> they have a lot of, uh, they have, they're, they're on a, a time pressure to come and get you. This is also a Turkish agent from Istanbul, and you've got such a large, passionate group of that Turkish fans. What, what kind of stuff do you go through to ensure that the agent feels authentically Turkish? Uh, what are some of the things that you've kind of gone into with the agent specifically to get that feeling out of the game? It's a, it's a pretty big undertaking and a large process, but basically, like, we, you know, we talked with some writers at the Turkish office. Um, we do a ton of research on our end, and then we find what we can that feels authentic to the country and the city. And we're like, how can this be inspiration for us? So, like, when we thought about this dark, edgy theme, we looked into like the mythology that surrounds Turkey and Istanbul. Um, you know, even thinking about her cat creature, we're like, okay, what does this thing do? It's tracking people down, it's hunting them, it's kind of like a predator. Oh, that's kind of similar to a cat. It, for folks that don't know, Istanbul has a huge cat population, so we're just like, okay, can we tie that together in different ways? Like, um, and then even down to like, let's start looking at like facial features, what are Turkish facial features. How do we integrate that into her look? How do we cast someone from that region um, that sounds authentically Turkish? So it's like a, a huge, huge undertaking. I have like, you know, 50 slides of research that we incorporate in some way and debate around and what are we going to tease and what aren't we going to tease? Um, yeah. Sorry, that was that was the short version of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great to get your insight into it as well. Okay, well, before we go, I do want to say as well, thank you for creating an agent that people are going to insta-lock because of just the edgy, awesome persona. <laughs> and she also provides information in the games. You have done a service to Ranked that you do not even know. You do not even know just yet, but it's, uh, yeah. You have uh, you've absolutely just made the Ranked experience much better for a lot of people, I yeah, think, including I'm me. I'm really sure you have, yeah. Thank you, thank you so much for coming and sitting down for an interview with us. John, Nick, really appreciate the insights. But also, I'm sure people are going to be itching to actually go and watch some more of the gameplay that's going to be available. So listen, we're going to take you back to the desk. And also, there's going to be some streamers with their hands on this kind of stuff too. So there's some awesome stuff coming up. Uh, thank you again, John, Nick. Really appreciate the interview. I'll send it back over to the desk. Thanks, Josh. That's right, it's us. We're at the desk. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, guys. Yeah, I don't know why Riot chose to give me money to work on their broadcast, but uh, yeah, here we are. Good to be. I don't know why they they chose Van Silly either. I mean, considering yeah, the, you know recent uh, sort of use of him, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> look, obviously, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about this a lot. We are going to be joined uh, momentarily by Ethos, who, uh, you know, obviously well-known content creator and now IGL for Square Warriors, which is a fucking <laughs> disgustingly cracked roster, by the way. Uh, but <clears throat> we can talk a little bit about uh, Fade before we we get a chance to chat to him because. They really, I really enjoy how they sort of hype, 
hyped her up here. The reveal was sick. I love how they integrated it with the stage. And I, it, 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 at this point, I finally realized the fucking theme of Masters Reykjavik, the Follow the Nightmare, was about fate. Her, yeah, yeah. It's pretty how damn sick. How did I not get this? Pretty damn sick. Actually, because I think every other time that we've had like a, an event and an agent was coming out, the agent was already announced before the event started, you know? So I, I feel that the Riot learned something new this time uh, or learned from that quote-unquote mistake to try to tie in everything together this time uh, into like, hey, we could do an agent reveal while we have a Masters event, just like, for example, Rainbow Six does when they want to... Um, introduce a new operator in their scene. So I think that works out pretty yeah. well in that favor. Uh, and Fade, I think, is going to be an agent that's going to replace Breach and also replace Silva. <laughs> gotcha. Uh, obviously, this this video definitely, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the theme of Champions, right? Because it's like everyone is dealing with their fears. You know what I mean? Like Brimstone had to like, get, you know, he, he deals with his fear of like giving up control and Sage and shit. Like, so that this element's getting explored a fair bit, to be fair, uh, through like Valorant content. But this is like very clearly, uh, I don't even know what this is. Does Chamber have a split personality? Or, like, that's kind of fucking. <laughs> it, it's, a, it's actually a pretty sick way that they, you know, explore the lore. And obviously, Breach wants to fucking break out of something. You know, I mean, this, this all uh, sort of makes a ton of sense. But, um, you know, the fact that you know we get a good idea thematically of what sort of fate is is sort of designed to do and a lot of people sort of worry i think about things like you know constant blindness or you know invisibility in valorant and uh, you know those sort of abilities that tend to tend to sort of skew the game a little bit but uh, someone who's had a good chance to play it uh is of course ethos who's now joining us man great to have you uh on the show of course previous content creator for nrg now like i said igl for squirrel Warriors, which is a really promising Looking roster just quietly. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking forward to see what you guys are up to. And I GL. Welcome to the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for the team and I'm super excited for Fade as well. I think uh, playing with Fade, uh, you know, the past two days has, has been really cool. Um, you guys touched on a lot of cool things about Fade, and and honestly, I, I'm I'm more so really excited to see what kind of variability we're going to see with Fade and, and kind of comps and the kind of combos we'll see fade bring with uh, other agent util other initiator util i think that uh, there's a lot of really cool stuff to be done out here now with fade and there's a whole new realm of possibilities how do you see that as an igl how how does how does fade slot into a composition now that you're like oh shit vct is coming up i gotta put something <laughs> up with fade yeah i mean i at, uh so like i already you already see with like you know a lot of these optic like haven comps and these breach comps right they're scaling away from the sova and they're switching over to like you know the sky breach the ko breaches um the ko skies even and i think uh fade is just a, a whole nother just kind of com combination in the pundit square that you can have uh with fade like it, again it's, it's with the flex role and i think there's just going to be a lot of different ways now that you can kind of default and take map control and, and get info. And, and it's really cool to have this new agent that has this forward info, info gathering uh, kit. And now uh, but on top of that, you have all this like cool stuff like the trails and the deafens and, and all that like really funky stuff. Like I can see some really cool set plays coming out, you know? Um, yeah, some really cool like, you know, bat, like reminds me back in the day, like when Vision Strikers invented the whole flash and dash kind of thing. It's like yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. really a whole new world of possibilities of of set plays and pieces that we're gonna we're gonna see coming up in VCT. So what what are the abilities actually uh, overall? So we're seeing an example of of what um, uh, off the clip here from Lothar. E, so right? yeah, exactly. So there's one that's like an eye that that's like a sonar dart that's gonna be able to find other people too. But how does that prowler or the haunt work uh, when? She's shooting that that ball that's coming out straight through the teleporter. The C, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, the prowler, uh, you can just use normally without any other ability, and it'll just like you can just kind of control it like a sky flash. And if it has a crazy LOS, so on, on LOS, it'll if it sees an enemy, it'll immediately lock onto them, latch onto them, oh, and yeah. if they don't break it in time, then it near sights them, and it's like really strong and if you how fast is it it's it's pretty it's pretty fast it's kind of scary to be honest like it's <laughs> kind of like kind of like a monster flying at you right um i mean uh the, the time where you just you have free control over it isn't that long so it's like you have to like find someone quickly with it otherwise it's just going to disappear mm -hmm. kind of like a sky flash but once it does lock on someone it's very scary and what's really cool about it is that 
when pairing it, using it after using like your E or your Q or your alt, um, you, you create these trails or whatever. And uh, basically it's, it's real. Then that way you can just send the, uh, the prowler on the trail. So it doesn't have to see them. Like oh, they could, it just follows it. Yeah. It just follows the trail. It just like, it's, you know, it's like a hunting, like a, like a hound. It sniffs them out and it, it follows them down. And it's really good. Like, um, you know, obviously for info and, and like, you know, um, blinding people but also just great yeah. for zoning too pushing pushing people back out of areas not letting them play up front um up forward in these aggro positions and uh, on top of that when you combo it with like flashes and and stuns and all this stuff right then it's like okay like you get stunned you can't break it and then it, it near sights you now you're stunned and you're sighted and now you're dead and it's like there's a lot of cool like possibilities and a lot of cool combinations you can pull off with it i i'm really excited to see I I feel that Twin Hunters uh, from Spike Rush is, is similar to that. <laughs> oh. Can you define it? Though? Is it fucking oh. moves he send out? Yeah, hundred oh, percent. It's it's just like the Twin Hunters. It's just uh, you know it's got a couple more steps. You got to be a little more purposeful with the. You can't just throw it and then it'll just find someone. You have to control it or you have to throw it in the right spot in order for it okay. to be usable. Uh, it's it's the same thing too. It's like um like you can't just throw it like out in the open and just expect it to like have good value. Like if you just throw it by itself and like and like they, they can just shoot it right so like you have to pick the good situations the good times and that's honestly what's going to make her uh, make her break the make the difference between good fades and and great fades and it's the same thing we'll see with like sovas and ashes and everything it's it's not only knowing about you know how to use your util but also when and where it's it's very situational it's all very timing based it's all very game sense based and by maximizing that you're going to get the you know the maximum kind of value out of your util and Fades also that type of agent. I feel like that is very easy if you don't know what you're doing to have a zero value. Yeah. Okay. So it's, they, it's yeah polarizing in that regard, right? You, yeah. Uh, you can you can be fucking pretty useless if you're a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. You just yeah. you just it's the same thing as a sofa. If you're just throwing darts at them and they're just breaking it all the time, or you're just joining in random spots, like it's it's useless. You know what I mean? So it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's one of those agents you really gotta like learn about like what kind of impact am I having by doing this right now? So now that we looked and explored her abilities, so we talked about, you know, discoveries of what, she, what Silva could do, for example, with the recon dart, the breach kind of like uh, ult style and even enforcing inflicting paranoia, like an omen. So you're already seeing like one agent that's missing up like three other agent abilities. Do you foresee then her coming out and then maybe having some sort of like triple initiator once again or will this open up a spot to be able to allow more duelists into the comps or are we looking at more like a single duelist comps and stuff of that still going into the metas i mean the overall direction that we're heading into i think we're we're kind of uh trying to weaken the the, the pre-existing meta and we're allowing for there to be more flexibility and variability yeah. like before like you think about like you know there's a sova like you have to have a sova on like three like big maps all the time like if you didn't have a silver, you were losing. Uh, same thing with like jet, like you know jet, like an eighty percent pick rate. Like you had to have a jet. Now jet's getting a nerf. Sova's getting a soft nerf, and now you're having fade come in, which is another info gather, like a forward info gathering uh, initiator. And so now we're just going to be seeing all different types of combos. The viability in different comps is it, it, it's all it's all up in the air now. You know, I really feel like Riot is doing a good job of just breaking down this pre-existing meta, this this one-dimensional way of playing and thinking. And now we're going to be able to see all these funky comps. Like, dude, we could see, <laughs> we could see like double, triple duelist again. Uh, we could see triple initiator. We could see no duelist. We could see, I don't know, triple smokes. I I don't know because uh, by by freeing up those those like must have agents now you can do a lot of really funky stuff like you can have yeah. the double smokes on on bind like the viper the brim and top of the on top of the double initiator you don't have to have a sentinel you don't have to have a duelist like mm -hmm. there's going to be a lot of really cool things you can do and i'm really excited to see what across all the regions uh in valorant what people are going to be labbing up you know I, i'm really excited to see um awesome yeah, obviously, look, you know, fade seems really promising. And I love that you bring out that, like, we're sort of breaking the mold on, like, how people are constructing their comps. Um, great that you're able to share that with us as well, because now a lot of people just maybe haven't had the chance to, to get to grips with her yet. Um, quickly, let's talk about let's talk about your team uh, and what's going on for you guys, because I think it's a really exciting project. Yeah, a lot of yeah. really proven players, including yeah. including yourself in this team. So what's going on with you guys? What's the what's the goal? What's the aim? Where are you at right now? All right. So right now um, we are I mean, we're the score warriors, uh, you know, in our bio, we are the nuttiest 
free agent <laughs> North American team. <laughs> oh man! And, and we I have the um, we have the we have our own hashtag hashtag Go Nuts. Um, I hope everyone <laughs> is going to go out there and support us um, when we're playing all these uh, big teams. And uh, and yes, I we are actually going to be uh, playing in VCT. Like this is the Six. most. Uh, promising roster i've um you know i've been i've been kind of sick so it's been hard to put in time but like over the last few weeks i've I've put in more time than i have with any other team and so is everyone else and we're really working hard getting our reps in and and building that foundation that strong base and getting as ready as possible for this upcoming vct because i feel like we can do some damage man i feel like we can absolutely do some damage and uh i think you know with enough discipline and with enough structure and with enough, uh, you know, set protocols with what we're doing, I, I really feel like we can definitely hang with the best. So look out for us in VCT and get ready for us to, you know, go nuts. <laughs> go oh, nuts, yeah. brother. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ethos, man, thanks for coming on the show, bro. Thanks for sharing uh, with us uh, your experience with Fight as well. Can't wait to maybe see you pilot uh, her down the track. I mean, yeah, I, mean I mean, I am playing Sova, so it is the kind yeah. of natural <laughs> transition uh, to, you know, switch me over to that role. So, <laughs> but, awesome. All right. Love it, love it. Uh, look, Anders, thanks for coming on the show, man. I know we've got we've got to leave you in a moment, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap things up here, mm -hmm. guys. Good to have you back once more. Another episode of Valoranting. It's been an exciting few weeks, so take a moment to breathe in and get excited because we're already jumping into next uh, VCT qualifiers very very soon. Thanks everyone out there for joining us next Tuesday, 11 p.m. P 11 a.m. Excuse me, PT. We'll be back with more Valorant. Until then, go and enjoy your fucking weeks and get excited for what is to come. And yes, fans, oh, yeah! the victory lap. Let's you go. Are, you did predict Optic to win. We all thought you were pretty ridiculous, but here it is. Congratulations. We'll see you guys next week on Valorant. Bye. Peace, Optic. We won't. <laughs>